We, we are on air. Advice is the Speaker of the House. Did you see your quote? No, no. I guess I guess uh, from now on. Now on? Yeah. <laughs> Folks, I think we'd like to call yeah, we'd like to call the meeting to order. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is a special workshop, Wednesday, April 3rd. Um, it's a workshop with the Board of Education around the Eight Corners Modular Project. And I think what we'll do is we'll start off with an introduction of sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of where we are and how we got here and sort of the recommendation. That will be followed by any, I know the Finance Committee has seen this, but some of the other council members and others have not. So it'll be followed by just some questions and answers that they might have. Once we conclude that, we will open it up to public comment to anybody in the audience that would like to make comments. And if we run out of time and from now to 7, public comment can continue over to the beginning of the town council meeting. So with that, I don't know if... Oh, I'll turn it over to Nick Gill. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And I'd um, would like to start by thanking our town council for making time for us this evening. I know there are other things on the docket that you moved around. Uh, this is a really important issue, and we appreciate being moved right to the head of the line. Um, so we're re just to kind of recap, we are here uh, to ask for the allocation of a portion of the school impact fees, which are collected to mitigate the impact of growth on our school system to support a short-term solution to the growing enrollment at Eight Corners Primary School. Um, I intend to keep this opening presentation focused on the short term. However, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, that uh, this proposal uh, occurs in the presence of some history, and there's certainly a connection to the long-term approach um, to the K-2 phase level. And so I, I did want to uh, mention that up front. And to that end, I am joined at this table by my fellow board members, as well as some of our key district leadership um, that can help us answer some questions about this allocation request and other options that were analyzed prior to this ask and the overall fit into the evolving vision of our district. So with that, I'll move the slides forward. Um, so hey, sure. Just ask you to pause. Please. Is the audio OK for oh, everyone? Can everyone hear? No? Oh, OK. Yes. I, can mic I can microphone if you want me to. I think it comes through good at home with those. No, the, the issue is these battery mics are perfect for broadcast, it picks up great audio, but it's just there's nothing to amplify that. That's the So none of those those podium mics would work here? Uh, they would, but we're likely to be running it right up against the meeting, and so okay. we're trying to do double duty here. Sure. Okay. Um, oh, wait, this isn't on. Is it? Hello? No. There's a, yeah, just press that once. Here. Yes? No? Oh, yes. there I am. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So short term, what are we asking for? Um, and basically what it comes down to is an allocation of $260,000 from our school impact fees that would fund the following. A single portable unit that contains two classrooms. Um, this unit will be purchased from Skiavi Homes, which is a subsidiary of Vanguard Modular Building Systems. Um, we're asking also for site preparation in the form of an asphalt pad. Uh, that would house both this single portable unit as well as the potential for an additional portable unit should enrollment play out the way that projections are forecasting it. And then finally, a heated connector that would allow um, students to pass between the new unit or units and the existing school as well as the portables that already exist at eight corners. Um, to break down the cost for everybody, um, that's $260,000, that is an estimate, breaks down to about $50,000 for the uh, asphalt site work, $30,000 for a heated connector, $160,000 for the portable unit itself, and then an estimated $20,000 for finishings, utilities, hookups, and all of that. And so for those of you that have seen this presentation before, you'll notice there's been some enhancements since the last time it was rolled out to everybody. Um, to start off, I just want to highlight that there's a few aspects of recent history um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we've had some challenging times in our town in the form of divisiveness um, from parties on every side that I believe are passionate and dedicated to education and passionate people. Among the many consequences have been the stalling of this process, and I'm not here to lay blame or fault for any of that situation. I'm really just here to discuss to the objective and factual nature of where we find ourselves today at Eight Corners. Um, so I'll start with this 2017 master plan. Um, it was uh, featured in November, I believe, of 2017. Um, this uh, graphic that you see up here actually draws attention to the fact of how many uh, portable classrooms we currently have at these schools in service. These are our three uh, primary schools, Blue Point, Eight Corners, and Pleasant Hill. Currently, there are four classrooms at Blue Point. 
uh, six at Eight Corners and two at Pleasant Hill School. And I'll show you in the diagram that's coming exactly where those portables are at Eight Corners for those that aren't familiar. Uh, the data from the plan suggested that the town should investigate or pursue, I should say, a consolidated primary school because it would be less expensive to build, to maintain, operate, and expand in the future. I want to remind everybody that's not uh, familiar with this that our uh, elementary schools were actually built quite a while ago. I had to do a little research on this. So looking back at our primary schools in 1957, Pleasant Hill School was built. In 1959, Eight Corners was built. And in 1965, Blue Point was built. And all those schools were comprehensively renovated in 1992. That's 27 years ago. Um, which struck me as, as kind of a shock the first time I saw it, and I think it's a, it's a testament to the hard work of our facilities crew, because those schools do not look 27 years old. Um, so uh, following that report, there were community conversations. A lot of this is anecdotal at this point, and the different accounts that I've heard. Um, overall, it was gathered that there wasn't a lot of community appetite for pursuing a consolidated school at that time. There was also a voice from the town at that time of other priorities that rose in front of a potential consolidated <laughs> school, namely the public safety building that is taking um, shape literally hundreds of feet from where we are, um, as well as a library expansion and um, a potential community center. That was back in 2017. Uh, I just wanted to, to recap that for folks. Um, <clears throat> So in the time since that occurred, uh, Eight Corners has continued to grow. And um, where we are now, and this is the data behind our predicament, um, there were 224 students enrolled at Eight Corners School, and that's for the, uh, for the year 2017, 2018. This year, there are 223, so essentially the same values. And in 2019, 2020, right now with our most recent enrollment predictions, we're looking at 254 students in that school. Um, that's a growth of about 31 students. That's assuming that we remain at a distribution of 37% of that phase level being at eight corners. Um, there actually is some data and some suggestion to say that more of the growth in town will be in the region that is currently served by eight corners. But if that ratio were to remain the same, that's what these growth numbers are based on. So the reality is, is that it's coming true. And I actually updated this moments ago. So uh, we had 78 kindergarten students um, as of right now at Eight Corners. That's this <coughs> academic year. Already there are 84 kindergarten students registered for fall 2019 with some additional ones that we know are on the way but have just not filed the paperwork yet. We have 20 plus students that are already um, registered with um, special services. That's 15 more school-wide than they have this year. There are five that are leaving, 20 coming in. Um, we still expect 10 to 15 percent more kindergartners to arrive at that school. That amounts to about 9 to 13 people, depending on the number you look at for the different growth projections. So it, it's a pretty serious situation. We look at these numbers coming true. I would actually say that I think the actual enrollment we're seeing is exceeding some of the projections that we have. And so the question really is now what? And um, I could speak to this, but I know I won't do it as passionately or as much conviction as the principal of Eight Corners, and so I'd like to turn the conversation over to her. Do you want to work this? you want me to do it? Uh, yeah, you can turn this okay. side, please. Oh, good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm Ann Lovejoy, principal at Eight Corners School. I've um, been in the district since 1999 and have been the principal since 2002 there. Um, so I've seen a lot of growth. I've seen a little bit of shrinkage, and I can now I'm seeing more growth again. Um, so I've, it's, it's changed a lot since I started there. Uh, what you're seeing here is some current space challenges. So one of these pictures is one of the in-class bathrooms. Most of the teachers there, um, the, when the renovations were done in 1992, those in-class bathrooms um, only ha had a single toilet in it and no other, no other shelving or anything. They were nice, clean, sterile bathrooms. <laughs> and the sinks are all in the classroom where kids can get water and wash their hands outside of the toilet area. Over time, though, teachers need more things to teach. They need more ability to have manipulatives and things to touch and, and play with and use. So storage has become a huge problem in all three K-2 schools. And our facilities uh, department has done an amazing job of crafting storage in every corner we can find. So hence the bathroom storage. And you can see on the 
that left-hand picture, the, the right-hand side of that is an over-the-door <coughs> hanging shoe pocket um, holder, which now has crayons and colored pencils and glue. And all of those things, it, while it's awesome storage, it is not ideal. You can imagine the hygiene and cleanliness of a toilet flushing in that room and no lid on the toilet because that's what an institutional toilet looks like. So it's, it's not the ideal, but it is the reality. Um, for all of the bathrooms in most of the K-2 schools. The picture on the right is a cubby area, which in, uh, in the original part of the building, and it's a beautiful wooden cubby area for boots and backpacks and snow pants and hats, and a shelf up top that was, I think, originally meant for a nice little lunchbox or something, but it is now storage for materials, because again, there are very few shelves where there's very there's no closets at eight corners that I have found. I've looked in behind every door and can't find one. Um, and if there is one that's <coughs> full of server equipment and um, <coughs> you know cleaning supplies and everything else, so um, teachers manage to you know be very organized with bins and totes and keeping things in their classroom. We do still have the looping program, which is. Um, teachers keeping their kids for two <coughs> years between first and second grade, so they have to have two years worth of curriculum in their classrooms. So <coughs> one year goes up on the shelf while they're utilizing the other year's curriculum um, down in the area where they can reach, so that keeps the materials out of kids' reach. And um, the tricky part is that there's <coughs> only 20 cubbies, so once you get to more kids, y you're, all, you're already doubling up, so or you know, cleanliness and hygiene again. Everything's already sort of shoved in there, but it gets even worse when you have more kids. So, and there's no room to add more cubbies, unfortunately, just due to the size and space of the rooms. So, one of my most serious concerns for space challenges is our functional life skills classroom special needs. Um, equipment we have children and have had over the last um, 15 years. Children of all kinds of needs. Many of, some of them have been in wheelchairs and had mobility issues. The equipment that helps them learn to walk, learn to get around on their own, learn to have balance and be upright and be with their <coughs> friends, um, often lives in the hallway, which means therapies happen in the hallway. Now, riding a bicycle in the hallway is kind of fun, and all the other kids think, I want to do that too, and that's great. But being strapped into a device to help you walk it's not the most dignified place to do that in the middle of the hallway. It doesn't provide you with the dignity and the respect and the privacy that you might need. Um, and those contraptions literally do not fit through the doorways of our classrooms unless the doorway, the door is completely open all the way flush to the wall and there is nothing else in the way to get that device into the room. Um, so it's just really tricky. So that lives in our hallway all the time. Every time kids go to recess, lunch, PE, they're walking by it. It's not safe necessarily. Kids trip over it. Um, it's, it's just uh, the fact, the reality of our lives right now. So we're hoping that a, um, a little bit of construction this summer will even give us a wider doorway just to be able to tuck some of that stuff into a classroom more easily to um, provide kids with some privacy and some, and some safety in the hallway. The picture on the right is a classroom, um, again, that has a changing area for kiddos who are on toileting programs. And so the curtain comes around and, and there's a bathroom tucked in that area. But at the same time, you'll see a child swinging who's having some occupational therapy and some sensory issue um, motor breaks and rewards, whatever the, the reason is that they often go in the swing. But that's all done right in that same classroom and five feet from where the bathroom and toileting area are. And that's not ideal for anybody either. It provides privacy with a curtain, but it's not, it's not what anybody would choose for their child or, or their, our students if we, if we had a, a better facility that could accommodate kids um, in a more dignified way. We, again, we do the best we can, and the teachers are amazing, and the staff is amazing, but it's not what you would want for people. Anne, could you just also speak to the, I see lots of tables in the hallway. What type of instruction happens in the hallway? Yeah, so in the previous slide, there's also other things in the hallway, as um, Dr. Kuchenberger pointed out. There are um, tables and chairs, and often parent volunteers or academic support or 
Other um, staff members take small groups of kiddos or individuals out there to read. And so it, again, it narrows those hallways and, and is not, not very private, but it is um, a, the only quiet space to go to <laughs> other than the classroom. So there's tables outside of every room for that opportunity, which again, just means something for the fire department <laughs> to say, please move that. <laughs> Um, this slide is um, a classroom space that was originally put on um, the end of our building in 2008, I believe, um, and it has no bathroom in it. It's uh, one of the only classrooms on that end of the building that does not have an in-class bathroom, but it is currently the music space, which is fine, except that it also houses adult um, adult desks and things on the other side of that partition. You'll see the two sides of that partition in this in this slide. So the kids have about two thirds of the room for music class and then instructional coaches, ESL, some other adult learning and adult support work goes on on the other side of that simply because there is no other place in the building to have um, space for these folks to, to work. Um, so the, the music program is doing the best they can obviously um, and they'll take two thirds of a classroom over music on a cart any day, that that's what we're going to be moving to if we don't have some more classroom space in the coming years because of our growing homeroom needs. Oh, thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> so one of the parts of the conversation we had with finance last week was what other options were considered. And so um, I just would like to reassure the community that we've done a thorough analysis of several different options. I'm going to highlight three here. I'm still going to speak to them in a pretty general sense because I want to be mindful of um, the emotional impact that thinking about doing some of the things I'll mention can have on our teachers and our families. They're not easy conversations to have. And although we can talk about them here th hypothetically, we all know how sometimes hypothetical conversations become um, narratives in, in the community. So the first thing we looked at was redistricting. This is something that Scarborough has done um, many times to adjust to our population growth and shrinkage, as Anne has talked about. Um, the one point that I would highlight here is that this is not as easy as it sounds. Um, as I mentioned in our last meeting, all of the kindergartners don't move on to Kindergarten Street, so it's not as easy as saying, we'll just take the new kindergartners and place them over here because there's a vacant classroom or place them over there because there's two vacant classrooms. Um, that just doesn't work that way. The other part we have to think about is sibling connections. So if your child starts kindergarten, let's say, at eight corner school and then is going to transition to first grade, you want them to stay in eight corner school and when you have an incoming sibling, you also want them to be in the same school um, for a whole variety of reasons that I'm sure all of us could relate to. Um, so it doesn't even necessarily mean that even if there was, which there isn't going to be, but even if there was one classroom available at another school, that we could even identify students who are first timers to pu Scarborough Public Schools because that <coughs> would become really inefficient really quickly in terms of busing. Right. Um, again, they don't all live necessarily in the same neighborhood or on the same street, so you're, you're trying to figure out how would you route those buses. Uh, we don't believe that's a long-term solution or a short-term solution. It's very disruptive. Um, Joanne Sizemore, our assistant superintendent, works directly with the transportation department, and she could be happy to share some ex past experiences with you of how that's gone in the past when we've redistricted. I know my first year coming to Scarborough, we had just redistricted. Um, and I fielded many phone calls of families that were concerned or felt like it wasn't fair because they intentionally bought their home in a certain part of our community based on the neighborhood school. And really at that point, if we're redistricting every time enrollment and fl fluctuates, we don't have neighborhood schools. And so we have to decide, are we going to have neighborhood schools or not? Um, so redistricting is not an option that we would, um, we would advocate for. Utilizing classroom space in other schools. So although I did share that currently there's a vacant classroom at Pleasant Hill and two vacant classrooms um, that are being utilized for one for a safe space and one for storage at Blue Point, our school board just heard from our K-2 principals um, right before this meeting. Enrollment numbers are already exceeding early enrollment. Pre-registration numbers are already exceeding current enrollment numbers. So we plan on utilizing all of those spaces to serve the students who live in those communities. Another option that we studied 
um, was possibly utilizing space at the Wentworth School. So very, it doesn't take too much um, sophisticated math to know the capacity of that school and then look at the current enrollment and to know that there is some available space. However, once you get schools into a space, they fill it. Um, and so there would be some serious implications if we were to try to move um, either a whole grade or a part of a grade to the Wentworth School. And so one idea that I thought of um, and explored was just, you know, could we fit an entire second grade at Wentworth School for a short-term solution, not long-term, because we know that enrollment bubble is going to lead to Wentworth. Um, and when I analyzed that, the impact that it would have on programmings at Wentworth wouldn't be worth the trade-off. And then you're still, you have that still disruption of, um, you know, students have an expectation that Eight Corners is their school from kindergarten through second grade. Um, and so we weighed all of those things as well. And, you know, my question to that point would be, do we want to compromise the programs at all of the schools to solve the issue that exists at one school or at multiple schools when the, the issue really could be solved at one school? Um, so that's not something that I would recommend either and can get more specific <coughs> about the, the quantifiable impact of that. Um, in another meeting. The other option we looked at was what Ann talked about. What about putting programs on carts? Um, and if you know any classroom teachers, it never feels good to not have a space to deliver your instruction. Not to mention we're talking about primary school, um, K, kindergarten, first, and second grade. So there's a lot of manipulatives. You saw all of that being stored in other places around the school. That's essential to developing really concrete skills. Um, and when we think about music in that room, in that picture that you saw, there's instruments, there's a piano. It's not, it's not so easy as to just put it on a cart. Um, and for art on a cart, that sounds kind of cute. Like, wouldn't that be fun, rolling in the art cart um, into a classroom? But again, there's a lot of materials that are required in order to deliver our art curriculum. And they, students have 42 minutes to go to art once a week. They rarely start and finish a project in that short little window of time, so there's lots of storing of projects that um, are underway or under development. Another part that's challenging, if we start propping those up, let's say projects on top of those bins that you saw in one of the pictures Anne talked about, if a child's project gets damaged between one week and another, um, anyone who has a young child at home or knows a young child, that doesn't go well, and there's no amount of explaining that it was an accident that's going to repair the damage that was done. Um, and I think we have to be sensitive to that and be mindful of the developmental phase in which our students are at. Um, and so I could not in good faith recommend that we just put art and music on a cart. These are programs that we value greatly in our community, um, and we've worked really hard to bring the arts back to the front of the conversation, and I think that would be taking a massive step backwards. Um, not to mention, it wouldn't fully solve the problem, right? So we'd be putting a bad Band-Aid on a bigger problem. So those are some of the options that we considered. I'm happy to speak more about that if that feels helpful. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm Todd Jepson, the facilities director for the school department, for those of you who I have not met. Um, a, a question that arose when we last met with the finance committee for the town was uh, there was a time constraint in getting these modulars onto the site, and assembling them and fitting them up and so forth. <clears throat> and the question arose about maybe stick building would be better. Um, so we need two classrooms. They're 68 by 28 feet, the whole structure, 1,904 square feet, um, <clears throat> and another two classroom set for the following year if needed. Um, the biggest difference uh, from this analysis is when you stick build something, you really have to put it on a concrete foundation. And from, we, we got pricing to, to create a concrete foundation for the modular uh, structures, and it is extremely expensive. It is more than twice as expensive mm -hmm. to just create a slab on which to put the modular. <coughs> uh, if you stick build something, you absolutely have to uh, build the slab. Um, so we can put these modulars on a gravel pad or an asphalt pad, which is much less expensive. 
uh, and, and faster. Um, it also, uh, so that, so building a concrete foundation would require more extensive site work. And then to, to stick build this, uh, it's actually a longer planning time. You'd have to engage engineers, make sure the snow loads and wind loads and everything is, is properly engineered. We would have to actually sit with an architect or a space planner to design the space to suit the needs of whatever ANS programs require. And so actually the planning time would take longer. Um, and the cost in dollars per square foot for construction, for example, uh, when we built Wentworth, now I know a modular is not Wentworth, but we spent $208 a square foot to build Wentworth. It's a $35 million building, 168,000 square feet. And so I, I rounded it up to 210, and in consulting some of my construction folks that I work with regularly, uh, to build a, um, a, just a cheap modular type of stick-built structure would be around $150 a square foot, and the modular that we would buy is about $84 a square foot. Mm -hmm. So it's a time and it's a cost consideration. So um, the final bullet on that uh, piece, uh, if you look at the consider this, if we were, uh, back in 2013-14, we were spending $210 a square foot. In the long-range facilities plan in 2017, in the consideration to build a consolidated uh, elementary school, uh, they projected that the cost would elevate. I think that the time frame, correct me if I'm wrong, was that we wouldn't build it until 2027, if I'm correct. But I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, Joanne. Uh, but the increase in cost per square foot would be $339 a square foot. I'm guessing that if we were going to build a Wentworth-like building, it would be well over $300 a square foot now for the fit and finish and everything. And again, there's a lot of other considerations to consider there. But each year, the point is that every year you wait to do something, it costs more money. So thank you to all of our district leaders that um, chimed in on this. As I said before they started, they can speak with this with more direct full-time experience and passion than, than certainly I can as, a, as an elected official. So thank you. Um, I'd like to take us full circle now and talk about what's in front of us, which is a short-term solution um, uh, in the form of a module classroom uh, that will allow us to, or classrooms, time, uh, two of them, that would give us space for our incoming students, accommodate or allow us to accommodate our special services needs by reallocating students out to the new areas. The special services will most likely be housed in the original building adjacent to where special services is now and allow us to do so with a reasonable and incremental investment of funds, as Todd touched on a few moments ago. On this slide, you'll see, uh, I can't take credit for this picture, I took it from Google. Um, and so you'll see a permanent, uh, a current picture of what Eight Corners looks like now from a satellite view. I have um, put in some conceptual, certainly not to scale, uh, color-coded areas that correspond with the different phases of this project. The blue phase is what we're asking for from the impact fees. That's the $260,000. Uh, the yellow area would be the conditional additional two classrooms that we would put on should enrollment play out and, and uh, allow us to be responsive and, uh, to that actual need. Um, I do want to point out that the area you see off to the right of where that connector comes in, those are the six classrooms that are portables that are there now. Um, so there actually are, are portable structures um, in place at Eight Corners as we speak. Um, the current cost of operation is estimated, and, and I want to thank Todd for helping me come to this, um, at about $1,000 for uh, the additional space that would go in. That's about a 2.5% increase to the current cost of operations at Eight Corners School. That's per month. That's per month? Oh, thank you. I was going to say, 1,000 sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, so some funding source options. I've touched on this a few times. In fact, I think I've probably said the word impact at least uh, 10 times. But I'll say it again. Um, our, our, top, um, our primary um, or our first option for this, the option that we're championing really, is using the impact fees for this. As you can see in, under the use of impact fees, this um, excerpted piece, they're collected by the town from new development specifically to mitigate the growth um, 
of the schools as a result of that development in the form of capital improvement. So we really feel that this project aligns very well with the intention of these fees. Um, it also aligns with the town council's goal of allocating more and bonding less. Um, alternatively, we would put this into the capital improvement plan budget. And the last piece I really wanted to share with you before we dedicate more uh, time to actual question and answer is just to take a look at our communications timeline. I've grayed out the things that have already happened. Um, so we first presented a version of this very presentation, which, as I said, has been beefed up a bit, um, on March 21st. We uh, then presented it um, on the 26th at actually a roundtable discussion because the public brought it up as a topic. So we had it for, uh, for everyone's um, digestion and conversation then. And then we presented this most recently at the Town Council Finance Committee. Um, and now we're here doing it um, again. So we really want to make sure that the public has a chance to hear about it, that all of us at the table have a chance to hear about it, and that stakeholders can be on board with this short-term solution, which I'll again just clarify is in addition to the long-term plans of the school board and the district. That's it. And I think the next is Julie's, there it is, wonderings and questions. So I think at this point, the, um, some of us at the, town, at the Finance Committee have asked some questions around this, and, and I think at this point, just open it up to those that weren't there. If any questions or anything else that you would like to share? <coughs> Councilor Kettering. I actually have two questions. Um, one is, uh, is there any resale value to the modulars? This is the real estate programming, wondering about. Uh, and secondly is how much is available in the impact fee funds right now. So just my two questions. Quite a few more. So the answer to your question is yes, there is resale value to them. Mm -hmm. CIV would take them back and resell them for us. It's probably going to be less than 50%, depending right. on how you, long right. you use them. Right. Um, we have some modulars that have been on this. Yep school campuses for over 20 years. Right. So obviously those aren't going to be worth much, but if we use it for, say, five or six years, we could probably get 40%, 50% back because they take them up to Oxford and they recondition them and they repurpose them to another district. Okay. And then the, how much sure. is in the impact yeah, so that fee? current balance is about $1.1 And <coughs> historically, we've used these fees to offset school debt. And we've actually brought in actual amounts collected from two years prior. And one of the reasons that I guess this request is somewhat fortuitous right now is that we actually had a tremendous year in 2018 and would be scheduled if we follow that same practice to bring in a sizable more, uh, quite a bit more money in about over $700,000 this year as compared to an average of about 265, which is the average uh, historically. So there is additional funds. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that uh, occurs to me, although that is attractive and will be helpful to help our budget this year, it will set us up for some challenges next year if we simply rely on additional kind of one-time money to offset debt. That debt will be fairly similar next year, and we just won't have the revenue to offset it. So uh, I would not be scheduling the use, heavy use of those funds anyway. Uh, Follow-up? Um, so, and, and part of I'm not on finance, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, so are we currently using impact fees annually yes. to offset school debt? Yes. Okay. yes. And, and what percent of impact fee or amount do we use each year, or is that...? It's the actual amounts collected from two years prior, so it varies okay. on average. It's been about 260000 a year. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Anyone else? Council Johnson. I too have two questions. Uh, <laughs> number one, did did we explore a possibility of putting a de, like a non-refundable deposit down on the modulars that would have, that would help us stay on the same timeline, but consider putting this into the to the budget. And my second question for Mr. Hall is: Is this the first project we've ever funded using the impact fees? Has it always gone towards school debt? During my tenure, it was, uh, in Ruth uh, Porter's here. I believe we've always used it for school debt. I'm not aware that we've used it to fund a particular capital item. <coughs> and the answer to your unknown refundable, because we're a frequent flyer with Skiavi, um, they would not require us any down payment. If I called him tomorrow and ordered it, he would order it. Okay. And then when the funds are available, we can pay them the funds. So, yes and no. 
There is an urgency, though, because yes. it takes time to fit these up. And school starts, regardless of whether we want it to or not, it starts <laughs> right before Labor Day. A uh, question. Yes, Todd, <clears throat> on, that, on that, what's, so if you ordered one tomorrow, when's the earliest they can deliver? They're telling me sometime in August. There's 31 days in August, okay. so I'm hoping it's, you know, <laughs> early August. But right. They, okay. It, it's so dependent. Um, these these companies now service the natural disaster oh, I know. Uh, market. Right. So if we get a hurricane or a tornado or something, we, to do we could get yeah. bumped. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you um, talk? Can you expand on that? Because you also talked at the finance committee level that if we delay in making this purchase based upon either the budget schedule or some other consideration, what does that do? Because it sounded like that it could push the schedule out well beyond August. And can, can you kind of cover that yeah. for me? Well, you know, ideally, <clears throat> and I think the the people working on the fire department next door would agree that it's not ideal to build anything after December. <laughs> um, Certainly site work you can plug away at, but when you're out there in the elements, it just slows everything down and it compromises your building materials if there would, which these would be. So, um, you know, ideally, I'd like two months to fit these things up and try to get them operational. Um, the timeline now is looking like I got two weeks. <laughs> so it's really going to push us into the later fall, which is then going to compromise the already cramped quarters at eight corners. So, uh, you know, I, I look at Ann and honestly say, we will do our honest best to get that thing open and ready, um, but they, we have to have uh, an alternative emergency plan in place in the event that some unforeseen condition arises and we can't get it done. Okay. But I'm, it's looking like later in the fall than September, put it that way. If I can follow, have you done any type of, what if the town council says no? Right. I mean, there's that chance. Have you looked at what that contingency plan is? Because I think that people need to understand how grave the situation is. Well, I think it's going to fall into looking at some of the options that Julie considered, like the things that are not so appetizing. Well, I think first, <laughs> if the town council says no, it'll be in the CIP budget. Um, and we will continue to advocate and we'll try to refine our story better. We'll try to get more evidence. We'll hear what the concerns are and why you're saying no and try to address them. But we're going to continue to advocate for this space because we absolutely need it. It's what's right and best for our kids. Um, worst, worst, I mean, literally, if the town council says no to accessing school impact fees outside of the budget cycle, it'll go into CIP. And then at that point, you'll either approve our CIP budget or you'll reduce our CIP budget. And we will have to take monies from other areas. And we will have to take money from other areas in order to get this space for eight corner school. But so other maintenance would be deferred, other projects would be deferred because we know that we need this space. So to the manager, but even if it's in the CIP budget, it can still be appropriated from the impact fees. It's just a timing scheduling, correct? Because there's three sources of capital yeah, improvement funding. I would recommend you do that for the reasons right. I mentioned earlier. But it, you're losing literally two months, right. I think, is the, right. seems to be the issue. So I would, I would advocate for those conditional, the yellow portion, yeah. those two, I would advocate mm -hmm. for those to remain in the CIP budget um, for this year so that the money can be ready for the next year. Because the, just the way our budget cycle works throws off the production cycle for us. Right, and <clears throat> even if we budget for it in CIP, we. Th Depending upon how the manager decides to fund that, it may or may not be bonded. That's not a local, that's not a choice that the school weighs in on. Um, we would only purchase those, uh, it, those conditional, the yellow two classrooms, if enrollment projections ex, you know, meet our expectations, which all indications today, before, you know, four months out before the school year, tells us that they will. It sounds like time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any ability to rent uh, structures? Um, well, I, they actually have some used structures sitting on the lot in Oxford, and I would invite you all to go look at them and tell me if you would like your children in them. <laughs> <laughs> they are hideous, and the newest one there is 2001. Oh, wow. um, 
and they take them in and refurbish them, but they come back because they've been sitting in a soggy lot and they're all warped. In fact, yesterday I drove to Wyndham <clears throat> and visited my friend Bill who does my job in Wyndham and he showed me a modular he put in at their public works department that was used. And the floor is like a rainbow <laughs> in it. <laughs> so they rent them, but they're usually used and tattered and not appealing and not what's best for kids, in my opinion. And you'd still have to do all the site work Correct. for a used one. Correct. So Correct. And in fact, I would invite you to come visit our Narragansett portable and see those behind the middle school. Those were used. I think those were purchased from Wyndham. They were okay. purchased from, from Wyndham. Wyndham. When, they it, when they added on to their high school. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And, and what's interesting about what you say is actually it dovetails very well with a question that we received via email. Um, you, know, you talked about the newest unit being from 2001. I think what happens often more than not, and it's come up in many uh, conversations from people in the community, is that people use these portables for longer than they're intended. These are supposed to be short-term solutions. They wind up being on sites for, for up to 20 or 25 years. Right. And, um, you know, I've responded to several of these inquiries, so I'm glad this came up because it was a great dovetail. Um, and, and I want to make sure that people understand that the Long Range Planning Committee is actually committed to using portables less as a permanent solution. And so this emergent need comes up, and at first glance it seems to go against that mission, that direction. But I want to be clear that a short-term solution, a short-term approach to this, while portable classrooms are not optimal, our goal is to not use these for as long as 2001 forward. Um, our goal is to actually work, in fact, the very next thing on our agenda, which is April 10th, uh, is to work with our committee to actually look at the Wentworth process and the build out that went into that, to look at the timeline, to look at the planning, <coughs> and to really get the conversation moving toward a permanent brick and mortar solution and approach to the growing enrollment issue because if we don't do that, as you saw in the 2017 master plan, we will be having these conversations like Groundhog Day over and over again every couple years and, and we don't want to be one of those people that's turning in portables for resale that are 20 years old because I imagine they didn't get 40% for that. <laughs> Uh, modulars that are at the middle school, the white ones that you drive by, the first four, were sixth the sixth grade learning community. Those were um, put in in, two, in 1998. Mm -hmm. uh, who's principal? Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Joanne. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? I think I misunderstood what you said. So there's, you said you could call them tomorrow and they would they would place the order. But I'm assuming the funding would have to be there. I mean, is there a way that you could call and that would hold your queue in line if this were to go through the normal budget process? Or do we step out of line and that's... So I, I was just trying to get clear about... Um, I would have to sign a contract yeah. and, and there would be a design component where we have to sit and talk about all oh, yeah, the yeah. features. And then he said that if he had to wait until July 1st to accept funding or whatever our budget cycle was, he would do that, but it would it would end at a certain point. So if we dragged our feet right. forever, but, um, but if he knew July 1, would it still be delivered in August, or is that or does it just delay the whole timeline? Yeah, I think it would delay it a little bit because there's no there's no there's skin no there, in the game, there's no shall there, we there. say. And so we would get bumped, shall we, shall we say, if South Carolina experiences a hurricane and so they suddenly need 15 modulars. To, house homeless folks. So it wouldn't hold our spot? I, I suspect not. It might at first, and then this, the first natural disaster that strikes. Okay. Or so, and I just want to get clear on that. So I think, yeah. Councillor Foley, do you have a question? Yeah. I, and I'm not sure if this is a Julie question or a Tom question, but um, so I'm hearing that historically these funds have only been used to um, reduce school debt. What other items besides something like this would you would we be even thinking about using funds like this for? Well, these funds are governed first and foremost by statute, uh, and much of that language is recited in their local ordinance. So they must be used for capital only. They can't supplant or go to replace operational cost. That's absolute. Um, since unfortunately we paid so much of local school costs uh, by the local tax dollar, uh, we've always had ample debt load to to pay off, so we've never been confronted with 
we probably have, have had emergent conditions, but we've never gone to this funding source in the past. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure the public understood that there we are limited by what we can use this for. So yes. appreciate it. Peter, can I add something to that? Just sure. uh, as part of the definition, because we talked about this at the finance committee. So I just want to make sure that it's understood what capital expenditures are, expe capital costs, because there are other things that you can have an allocation for. So as an example, we heard stories of um, boilers that are absolutely needed, I believe, at the middle school and other kind of capital. So it can be used for those bigger projects um, that are being discussed as far as within their budget. Um, so it's not just about buildings. It's also about other kind of bigger projects that it could, you could technically use that impact fee for. Right. I'm not sure where the money came from, but my very first two months here, we had an emergent situation at the old Wentworth with the asbestos in the windows. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And we had to ask, I remember standing right there and asking for $140,000. I'm not sure where it came from. I was so new then, I didn't even know which one end was up. But the money came from somewhere, so we were able to address that emergent need. Um, and so I don't know, Tom, maybe you can remember whether that came from impact. It certainly didn't not. come from this source. I, I, I'm at a loss. I think it probably was fund balance. I think uh, it was such an emergent situation that the council did what it had to do to make sure you get the abatement done. Kate is nodding. I remember it was fund balance. So I, uh, I like what Julie had to say about how hypotheticals sometimes become narrative, you know, and this whole topic about, well, we're not making a commitment to using modulars, but we've got to do it. And I, I understand and appreciate the need. The photos are very helpful to understand what kind of clutter you're dealing with now. I, I uh, by the way, our youngest son was in those modulars uh, at the middle school in sixth grade for four years. So, so we had personal experience with it. Uh, and uh, you know, he did okay. Um, but what I'd, what's missing for me though is that we, we said this is a short-term, you know, immediate thing we need to solve for, um, but people are still asking the question, so does that imply we've made a commitment to um, neighborhood schools, or how does that affect the work, the good work that was done? And I've read all of this, uh, the work that was done in 2017 and the updated enrollment data from tw January 2019. So my question is, when when will we? We're not, I don't want to hold up this project and this decision for sake of that, but when will we update that work and how, you know, and you may not know that, but uh, it would be helpful to get a, a sense for when we will come back to that. I can start with that, and then I'll, I'll pass it off to Julie to, to add anything she would like. I mean, um, I can say that since the 2017 uh, facilities plan was presented, um, essentially, right after that, the Long Range Planning Committee was no longer actively meeting for whatever reason. Uh, one of the very first, in fact, I think the first committee we revived once the board was back at full power was the Long Range Planning Committee. This actually was the conversation that we started. Our very first meeting was at Eight Corner School to actually have this conversation. Um, and then what kind of got in our way was the immediate short-term need that was coming into fruition from the projections. And so to answer your question really succinctly, um, we have made a commitment to the neighborhood schools for the next few years, and quite frankly, we don't have much of a choice. They're the structure that we have. They're the places that we have to put these students. Um, the conversation uh, about moving forward with what's our long-term approach, I think we're going to be here as the chair of long-range planning, I can say we're going to be hearing a lot more about that very soon. Um, the data is very strong in saying that we uh, should be looking at a, pri a consolidated primary school. I, I would guess that's the direction that the conversations will probably go. I think there will be some challenge to it, but I think there's more of an appetite for that now because of this conversation, really, than there was years ago. Um, and that needs to happen, and we need to have some more answers on that, I would say, within the year about where we're going and, and what kind of direction we're committing to. Because if we don't, we'll be back here doing this again. Thanks. And I'd like to just add one data point. I mean, reading through the material, one thing that really struck me is that you did an analysis of the multi-family unit impact, and there were two, uh, uh, there were basically just two large developments that aren't even finished yet, Avesta and the Beacon at Gateway. And, and your estimate is uh, uh, it could be 80 to 100 plus students in K through 12 from those two alone. 
so i i want to just put that out there because it i have a feeling of looking at an iceberg and then wondering why my boat is sinking you know it's sort of it's here already and the speed at which this is happening is is really fast and the disruption associated with it is as well so i you know just kind of underlines your your commitment to continue the dialogue and move this along uh, in terms of the strategy, the strategic discussion. Well, and if I could quote, quote Monique, who's our director of curriculum, she always says, people have to be ready, people are ready to hear when they're ready to hear. And so although it feels like all of a sudden this conversation is being accelerated, it doesn't feel that way to us because we've been saying it's coming and not at this magnitude, obviously, because we didn't know what we didn't know. But even our old enrollment study, if you look at that closely, showed that this was coming. Um, and to that end, you know, I want to just kind of share with the community that we are being really thoughtful and trying to be as fiscally responsible as we can be. One example I would give is that um, one of our special education teachers at Eight Corners this year was advocating for a shed to house some of the materials uh, and the equipment that she needs. And Todd and I talked about it, and we looked at where it would go, and we talked about the logistics of that, and you know, asked ourselves, are we really solving the right problem? Because at the end of the day, we know this a shed, adding a shed onto the Eight Corners front lawn isn't going to get us where we know we need to go. And so it was hard to have to say to that teacher, I know it's only a shed, a couple hundred bucks, maybe a thousand bucks but we're not willing to make that investment because we know that's not going to help us get to a better solution and so just hang in there with us so we are having these tough conversations with our staff and trying to um, be as responsible as we can be the other thing I would add is that um, as we were transitioning from you know a, a four member board to a full member board one of the other things that we did was advocate with the Downs project to and, and the town manager to say one of the things that would make that credit enhancement agreement mean more for us or be more responsive to the community needs was to have some sort of commitment that there would be space available within the Downs to potentially build a school. And that was one of the adjustments that was made. So trying to move the needle as far along as we can at each step of the way. Um, and so that's that's an ideal location in my mind of where either a consolidated school could go or a fourth neighborhood school if that's what Scarborough decides is right and best for them. And then in terms of timeline, in terms of timeline, I think ideally and to be reasonable, your best bet would be if there really is commitment and you have full council and full board um, commitment to engaging the community in a really thoughtful process that um, I'm confident the long-range planning committee will facilitate with your new superintendent is that ideally this would be on the ballot in June 2020. That you would be, whether no matter what way you go, you gotta have that timeline in mind. And I think that would be a reasonable, um, aggressive, but yet reasonable goal for this community. I would just like to um, reference the old Wentworth School because for many years I was involved with um, Ann Mary Dexter in regards to we need a new school, how are we going to renovate this and so forth. And we just kept on talking and it kept on being postponed. It wasn't until a crisis came that the windows couldn't be opened at all on the north wing uh, for I think it was three months until the asbestos could be removed and the people were in that building that really got the uh, building committee of 40 people engaged and ready to go. But even with that, it took five years to get the building. So, you know, it was, it was until a crisis that really pushed that building because for so many years we kept on advocating for a school. Julie, I just... I just wanted to add, I'm not sure if every if everyone's heard this, or, or I know the Finance Committee probably has, but I also just wanted to add that um, after the 2017 um, plan was done, the decision wasn't to do nothing, it was to put um, our school, to go through the process of putting our schools on the list for state funding, mm -hmm. um, and we did uh, to go through the process for all three primary schools and the middle school, and that was a long process, and it took a really long time to get back to us. Um, and it did come back that, and, and there's, we have no chance. I mean, I think I can say pretty definitively, <laughs> we have absolutely no chance of getting any funding. Um, but I just wanted to add that in case you were on the finance committee and, and, um, and hadn't heard that. 
Well, that's very true, and, and I think it's what we have to do. We have to apply, even though I think that everybody around this table knows that it's a long shot <coughs> for Scarborough to ever get off, you know, get the money um, that's allocated for schools in that list. So as a community, we cannot rely or expect the state to give us any money to build a school. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the town government here has an opportunity to say no to growth and to say no to new developments and new buildings. The schools cannot say no to the students who come to this town to be educated. So we can't close our doors. And the consequence of growth is the critical condition that we're in right now in terms of eight corners. And it's going to continue with the other schools. And with that, any, any other counselor? And just yeah. 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 Um, just want to say thank you to the school board and the town council for having me at the table and listening to the needs at eight corners. And, uh, you know, I, my school is the most critical for this year, but Pleasant Hill and Blue Point are not far behind with the growth. They are not um, easily expandable, and there is not an easy place to put on more modulars, portables, trailers, whatever you call them at their locations. Um, so we are at a critical junction, and um, I just really want to say thank you again for listening and, and hearing us, and if you have any desire to come and see the school, I am more than happy to give you a tour, as I'm sure the other two K2 principals would be as well, but I'm happy to, um, to show you around and look, show you what we're working with and what our thinking is and what we've done to, to try to mitigate what we've got right now and how we're working with the space we've got and, um, and show you, you know, how, how amazing our staff is at working with what they've got. Um, so I urge you and, and welcome you into our school any time. Please just let me know if you'd like to come and thank you again for supporting our schools. Thank you. Any other counselors have any comments? The only thing I would add to that, if you are going to take Ann up on her offer, which I absolutely hope that you do and bring a friend, is going right at pick up and drop off. Um, because that is also a site to be seen. So I would recommend it's only a half hour out of your time to get a really deep um, understanding of what we're working with. So that would be arriving at like 8.45 or 8.35 um, to like 9.10, and then you could be on and about your day. That'll give you a really good insight. If you're a morning person, if you like the afternoon, um, pick up and drop off starts at what, and Like 3.10 to 3.35? So, no, it's like three. I mean, if you want the, if you want, you to want the, the full experience, yeah. you need to be there before three. Yeah. So watch the crowd gather in the parking lot fill up. If you don't want to park down by Shaw's or two forty-five to to three thirty, three fifteen, three thirty, you'll get the full experience. Even one more car to, to <laughs> no. go to that <laughs> carpool. Shuttle I, uh, I don't need the full experience. I walked it when it was vacant on a Saturday morning, and I've seen, I've seen. Enough Thank to you. know what the Thank issues you. are. So, if you want to save yourself, <coughs> I know. I know we're kind of bumping up against our hard stop, but I did want to check: is there anybody in the audience that would like to make some public comment before we close out? Um, see, no, I don't think. Is anybody? No. Um, so, I guess the only question I'd have <coughs> for the council members is this: we had talked about after this workshop. Um, actually, yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll you a little bit, Nick. I think we sure. did have a letter or an email that, with a constituent that asked a lot of questions. Nick did a mm -hmm. great job of addressing some of those. I don't know if you want to kind of paraphrase um, what sure. the public comment was and kind of your response. I thought you did a good job. Of sure, I, I, I think I did a little while ago. I did, didn't, didn't I? Yes. No? Um, pretty much uh, the concerns really have been, and this concern is an example, this is from Ms. Marlizando, um, really talking about um, what Julie touched on, which was the redistricting, can we move kids to Pleasant Hill? She remembered overhearing that there was some vacancy there, there was some vacancy at Blue Point. I, I think from what we heard um, earlier today, actually in our budget workshop, fortified kind of what we already knew, which was that while the growth is a little bit ahead of the curve at eight corners, uh, Pleasant Hill and, and Blue Point are catching up. And so moving students over there really won't buy us much time, maybe one academic year, if that. 
Um, and so um, what I responded to her was basically saying that, you know, these options have been looked at. I wanted to reassure her that this is not more of a commitment to the permanent use of portables. I think that's really important for our community to understand and that this is a temporary solution as our community takes time to flesh out a permanent approach, which I'll just wrap up by saying, as Joanne said a moment ago, in the best case scenario, if we were able to leave this room right now with a beautiful plan of how to build a new school and I drove down and stuck a shovel in the ground, we're still not talking about, you know, four or five years where there were students walking in there. So it takes time for these things to work out, even when they're not funded by the state, when they're funded locally. And so this approach is a good temporary approach while still committing to less long-term use of temporary classroom space. Thank you. Okay. So I think as, as we close, I just wanted to kind of get a consensus of the town council. We had the finance committee we did talk about having this workshop tonight. We need to put an opportunity to, to learn more. And based on that, putting on the agenda for the next meeting, which is April 10th, which is next Wednesday. Is that the consensus of the council? Are folks comfortable with it? As I look around the table, I see one, two, three, I would support that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess with that, I thank all of you for spending your hour on a Wednesday night with us. And with that, that's just the first hour. We got more to come. More. Stay in for the long haul. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
including a prior workshop. So welcome everybody. This is the Scarborough Town Council meeting, April 3rd. Um, and we'd like to call the meeting to order at this point in time. Um, and we'll take the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And with that, roll call. Council Baybine. Present. Council Johnson. Here. Council Foley. Here. Council Hamill. Here. Council Dunlin. Here. Council Katarina. Here. Chairman Hayes. Here. Um, item number four is general public comment for any item that's not on the agenda this evening. That, would anybody like to come to the podium and share anything? Um, seeing none, we'll close. Next, next item is item number five, to approve the minutes of the March 14th Special Town Council meeting and the March 20th, 2019 Town Council meeting. Motion to approve. So moved. Take it. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item six is adjustments to agenda. There are none. Item seven, items to be signed to treasurer's warrants. I will do that as the meeting progresses. Item eight is the non-action item, but it is the joint presentation of the proposed fiscal year 2020 municipal and school budget. And I think probably Tom and Julie will yes. lead us through that yes. process. Yeah. Speak to you from the podium. Well, good evening. That time of year again. Uh, we're certainly pleased to be before you this evening. Uh, tonight is really a combination of months of work from uh, Dr. Kutzelberger, myself, and our senior staff, really all of our staff. So uh, this is a bit of a rite of passage uh, for us, but we certainly appreciate there's a lot of work ahead. And we're excited to share our budget proposals with you, with the public, and to really start a wider conversation. Um, but it really does feel like a, a bit of a handing of the baton. What we'd like to do tonight is really provide a very high level of overview uh, of the budget presentation. Uh, we'll certainly leave you tonight with uh, a couple of those high points and some process related uh, uh, questions, or excuse me, uh, piece of information so folks don't have to stay engaged, get involved, and really make the concerns known as we go forward. So let's uh, jump right in. At a glance, uh, we figured it's best to go right at it. This table really encapsulates everything that uh, we display on what we call the tax rate computation page. This is kind of all the, everything uh, together here. And, uh, we're reporting both gross and net for both uh, town, school, county, and capital. And it's really important that we, uh, I think we develop a really robust capital program and capital budget. And it's important that we spend time talking about that. Uh, there's a great workshop just, uh, that preceded this meeting uh, that focused on the sort of needs of has, and it really, uh, the capital budget is where a lot of those conversations happen. Uh, so all in the town uh, net change uh, is 2.4%. Uh, we are blessed with a number of non-property tax revenue uh, opportunities. And without getting into the particulars, uh, the sorts of non-property tax revenues that have gone up this year include, thankfully, um, increase in the municipal revenue sharing in the town, um, our child care uh, Operation is actually doing quite well. We're uh, proposing some additional revenues through, through that means. Excise tax continues to perform uh, wonderfully well. Uh, and finally, EMS building. We've uh, had some improvements in our collection activities. And I mention that because that's a little distinct difference between the town and the school. We have the luxury of having uh, non profit tax revenue sources, and that really certainly helps us produce the sort of net results that you're seeing here. Beyond that, the school is coming in at 5.7%. Uh, it was good news with general purpose aid to education this year, which is something that we have not been able to stand here and, and advise you. So that certainly helped. Um, the county has, uh, is coming in at 4.6%, dollars increase. Our capital budget uh, is jumping off the page there. We do have some uh, very sizable capital requests. A number of these large, high dollar value projects will need to go up and obtain voter approval. They are, and they come uh, through the council uh, by way of the capital budget. And so uh, overall, we're looking at just a 6% increase, 6.04 to be exact, uh, 
uh, on a net basis for the budget. Um, and we really thought that this display really captured in a single chart uh, was the best representation of all the costs uh, that will be before you and included in the budget. Leading up to tonight, uh, Dr. Kugelberger and myself, oh, I beg your pardon. I skip one slide. Uh, so here's the bottom line. This is uh, right to the bottom. Uh, our net budget, as I said earlier, is up 6% uh, using the town council's uh, accepted policy to estimate future value. Uh, we're showing uh, you know, a range of that estimate uh, in, in the shade uh, uh, line in the middle. Uh, it's worth noting that given the fact that we had a commercial industrial revaluation last year that had a sizable impact on value, we have chosen to exclude that from this calculation. Essentially, we have not used that, uh, that year and the annual growth that occurred because it really is abnormally high comparatively. We simply carry forward the, the annual growth from the prior, prior year for purposes of using this calculation and, and want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. And so what that all means is uh, that there's a projected bill rate increase uh, somewhere between 4.33% and it could be as high as 5.46%. Uh, again, this is a function of the town council policy uh, regarding how to report these things at this early juncture. Uh, it's certainly worth noting that our track record, I think, speaks for itself. Uh, these can be scary numbers when we start the conversation, but I think uh, every year that I can think of, we end in a much different place, and more often than not, with maybe one exception, we have actually met the council's goal by the end of that process. So uh, this is very much the start of the conversation, and I don't want folks to get too anxious about the numbers. I, I have the utmost confidence that the community and the council and the Board of Education uh, will work through these discussions, help make further decisions and choices, and get us much closer to where you want to end up. So leading up to Right. Dr. Kruger and myself uh, conducted a number of listening sessions in the community. This is a, a program that we started last year. We held four. And on the town side, uh, one of the major themes that emerged out of that process is maintain current services. Uh, one of the sessions was entirely dominated uh, by the Higgins Beach community regarding the sort of efforts that we put uh, forward in terms of uh, that, that neighborhood and its uh, unique uh, needs. But that was a resounding theme that I heard. And this budget does certainly that. It maintains current levels of service, services. Beyond that, uh, it's addressing additional service demands. And uh, not unlike uh, some of the challenges the school has, the town is presented with similar challenges. As this community grows, we get more lane miles to plow and maintain. Uh, police and fire have similar challenges in, in their service demands. Um, so this is representative of uh, some of those growth factors. Uh, beyond that, we're also looking to add some additional, uh, an additional position I'd like to talk to you in a little more detail in a moment. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julie, and she can go to the school side. So in addition to the listening to learn sessions that Tom and I uh, hosted and facilitated this year, we added another layer, listening to learn from our teachers, that occurred in December. And one of the things we heard about is hear from our teachers Increasing class sizes are not acceptable and not manageable, um, given the types of needs that our students are having. So in this budget, you'll see us responding to um, that ask of our teachers, but also to... Responding to that ask from our teachers, but then also responding to the increasing enrollment. Um, which we, there's lots of reasons for the increasing enrollment, the growth in the community, of course, being one of those factors. We also, um, in this budget, address a community need to expand career exploration. This is the third year in a row that we've been asking for this, and this year it's in our budget proposal. With that being said, we're also looking at um, adding some technology and engineering opportunities at Scarborough High School. So currently, it's been kind of piecemealed between our math department and our science department, teachers covering classes that students are asking for. We have a really robust um, STEM program from grades three through eight 
and some tinker labs and, and maker spaces at our K2 schools. And then you get to the high school and the, it really drops off a cliff in terms of what we're offering our students. And um, as Principal Ketch said earlier today in our workshop with the board, we've reached a critical um, inflection point for both of these programs. And so these are also things that our community is asking for um, and we're trying to respond to that within this budget proposal. So from the town side, there's some primary drivers that I just want to touch on uh, that are really making a difference in this budget. First, this comes as no surprise to me, and certainly I suspect no one in the room, uh, this is the first year that we have all the debt service costs for the public safety building. This is a voter approved project. Uh, I really enjoyed tremendous support by the voters. We're forever thankful for that. So we have over a million dollars of debt related costs for that project alone uh, coming in and, and uh, <coughs> being due this year. Bless you. Uh, so we did retire some debt, and so on a net basis, it's about a $400,000 increase, but uh, a million dollars in new debt for the public safety building. We, of course, have contractual obligations to deal with. Uh, we have a number of uh, union contracts. Again, no surprise, but those are, those are drivers that, uh, that have an effect, obviously, in the bottom line. Uh, that also includes non-union staff as well. Uh, we also have this uh, new phenomenon. We have new recycling costs. We've never, ever had to pay for recycling in the past, other than the cost of collection. Now, with some changes in the global uh, market, frankly, uh, and we're not alone. We're, we're a, a member of community of EcoMaine. Everyone is being similarly challenged in this, but there's a $90,000 cost to this community uh, for purposes of uh, around recycling. Uh, I have talked to Council Chair Hayes about uh, arranging a uh, special workshop with the Council to really understand some of the dynamics at work and what it means for us. <coughs> what sorts of things can we do as a community to, to reduce uh, or defray some of those expenses? But those are some of the primary drivers I would touch on from the town side. In terms of new investments, uh, there are a number of new staff positions that we uh, I do want to advance, and I have included funding here. Uh, first and foremost, we are uh, trying to get back on track with a long-standing staffing plan for the fire department. This has uh, been a goal of ours for at least the 10 years I've been here, and I think it predated me somewhat. But we're really looking to move to a, uh, a full-time um, fire department. And that's not a simple or cheap endeavor. Uh, and with fits and starts, we've been able to advance that through the years. Uh, and we should be proud. Uh, but we, re we really need to maintain some vigilance. So, uh, <laughs> the computers are going to be. We may have to take a moment just for the lamp to pack up on this projector, but we'll proceed with the monitors if that's okay. Uh, the other uh, new investments on the town side involve, uh, for the first time ever, funding and equipment reserve. This is something the finance committee has talked about for years. And uh, the current finance committee uh, actually had some very detailed discussions. And so, this is the first step to start to fund and put money away so when uh, capital needs on equipment, arrive, and those are very, very predictable. We actually have money saved in reserve accounts to pay for those things. Uh, beyond that, uh, I am very aggressive in this budget about shifting how we fund our capital program. Uh, essentially, anything under uh, uh, under $100,000 and a couple of things over $100,000, uh, I'm proposing to do by way of appropriation. And again, that's a long-standing goal of the Finance Committee. It remains to be seen that this is the year we can make that entire shift. But I wanted to see what a budget would look like uh, with that as a starting point. And uh, I guess I'll just um, editorialize it a bit. One of the challenges that Julie and I have, I, I think, in setting this is that we're acutely aware of what the budget goal is and kind of 
of the sensitivity around any number of factors, yet we're also professionally obligated to put forward what we believe are the funding needs of this town. And those two are often incongruent. And uh, it's a delicate balance to try to find uh, a way to start this conversation. And so this is one of those items that has been talked about. And frankly, unless I put it in the budget, uh, it's not likely to, to be advanced very far. And so there it is. And I'm pleased to sit with the finance committee and talk about whether that's the right time and the right thing to do. So let's move to the school side. <coughs> <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, increasing enrollment, of course, is a primary driver for the schools, um, particularly at our K-2, but this is something our community really needs to be paying close attention to. We report on enrollment every month. We've been watching it closely for a number of years. Because one of the things we know is that this bubble is going to work its way through the primary school um, to our regular school, to our middle school, and to our high school. So um, that really sets the stage for what you can be expecting in terms of a multi-year budget. We also, in this budget, um, have significant increase in required and appropriate services that are based on individual student needs. Um, so child development services is a process that um, families can engage um, in evaluating their child's needs if they're noticing developmental delays between ages three to five. And then when those students come to us, we are aware that these students have required some early intervention, which is a good thing because early intervention is the most cost-effective way for us to serve our students ensure that they have success for life. With that being said, this year in Scarborough, we have the highest number of incoming students already identified through child development services, which means that they require really specialized services and supports. And you'll see that um, in our budget detail. A, a driving factor for us also is salaries and benefits. Um, each and every year, wages go up with cost of living adjustments and, and lane changes, and then of course benefits um, for our staff. Given that that 76% of our budget is always going to be a primary driver, um, again, I say that's a good thing because our human resources are most valuable resources. So we want to make sure that we're serving them well. Excuse me. I just got a text from the hubby at home. He can't hear you guys on TV at all. Oh, okay. Now it's working. I don't know. Wait a minute. All right. Test, <laughs> test, test. Hubby at home. Can you hear now? <laughs> Jeffrey. <All right. laughs> So what, is, um, what are the new investments for the schools? Uh, we've, yes. we've kind of categorized them together for you. And again, a big broad overview. I invite you to come to the school board first reading tomorrow night, where we'll be going really deep in details. Um, but I've categorized these for you in these um, three areas and then showing the total of what are the new investments beyond, above and beyond our budget. So required services, again, that's driven by um, individual IEP needs of students. These are not choices. We can't decide to meet a child's individualized needs or not. We are required by law to do that, but it's also what's right and best for students. Um, so this year, for us, that's $629,000. So as much as it feels good to know that we're receiving um, 623 additional dollars from last year in general purpose aid, remember that that additional funding is calculated based on 45% of our special education costs um, from two years ago. And so it's not a windfall. It's certainly not like, gee, what are we going to do with that money? We're still minimum receivers and currently only receiving about $3.3 million from the state and general purpose aid. And we have about a $47 million budget. Another new investment that you see here are new staffing requests. Um, again, I get the sticker shock of that, but remember what I'm saying about the required services, that's bringing in staff um, that are required. It also calculates that increased enrollment response. And so we are projecting to have an additional three teachers at our K-2s. Um, this also includes that STEM teacher that I spoke about earlier, the career pathways teacher that I spoke about earlier, and a few other critical positions. And then we have some additional funding um, built into the budget to respond to the additional classrooms that we will need. We also need supplies to outfit those classrooms. And um, this also includes a small portion of money, $5,600 for Wentworth School instructional supplies. 
During our line-by-line -line item analysis this year, we noticed massive disproportionality between how we were um, supporting the teachers at Wentworth and uh, compared to other schools. And so we wanted to correct that within this budget proposal. So all totaled new investments, $1.2 million for the schools this year. So that brings us back to the bottom line again. We want to end where we started. Collectively, as a town, we have a 6.04% um, net change in our, in our net budget. We also look at the assessed value, as um, the manager explained so eloquently in the beginning of the meeting. So our projected mill rate at this point, remember we're just starting the conversation. This is not, we know this is not where we'll end, but we're looking at a range from 4.3% to 5.5% to um, in terms of the projected mill rate. So what items are still in motion? Uh, we're always at this point in the budget process, much to, um, to many folks' frustration, still looking at the final health insurance costs. We haven't yet received that. Um, and this isn't just our anthem rates for the school department. This also includes workers' compensation, um, property insurance, casualty insurance, so when accidents occur, legal liability, so if there's a due process hearing or things of that matter, vehicle insurance, dental insurance, all still in flux. We, don't, we have estimates for that based on um, multi-year averages, but we don't have final numbers just yet. This year, um, our school board negotiations team is negotiating our largest um, uh, collective bargaining agreement, which is our teacher's contract. We have over 311 <coughs> staff members who are um, included underneath that. That's all certified staff who hold a professional certificate. So we have to be mindful of um, good faith bargaining as we plan the budget, and that process is well underway. Of course, special education and enrollment, it's always in flux. I think every day I hear new numbers of more students who've pre-registered um, or more students who are scheduled to come to our schools. And so as we work through first reading into second reading, we'll continue to refine those numbers and make adjustments for you and be really open and transparent about that so you can follow the story as we build the, the final budget. Um, and this one, I really, it's kind of a call to action for our community. Last June, we voted on the, po the possibility of joining a regional service center. Last year, it meant an additional $46,000 for our community. Our voters, by very small margin, said no to that. Partly, I think, my assumptions are busy ballot and confusion with the other question one. Um, it will be on the ballot again in June. This year, the stakes are higher. The amount doubles. And for us as minimum receivers, this is really important because this comes outside of the funding formula. So it literally is an added $83,000 to our budget. $83,020.60 or something, I think, actually. But if we say no to that in June, that money goes back to the state. They wasted no time taking back the 46,000 this year. I imagine it to be much the same. So we're really looking for community support around this. Not only does it bring that extra funding to us, it also allows us to be more efficient throughout the year as we partner with other school districts in the region to deliver professional development, um, to purchase uh, products for food service. And we're also looking at a few other areas that we can share services. So it's a win, win, win. We pay 1,000, we will pay $1,000 a year to be a member of that. Um, so certainly a good return on our investment. So I, I put this last item up. Uh, the town is uh, currently in process with a residential revaluation. It's a piece that will affect the final tax rate. Uh, purposely, at the direction of council, it's not included in any of the calculations or estimates that have been shared tonight. But it's a big looming piece. And just we all need to be aware that that will, in the end, uh, have an effect. After all, 75% of our tax base is residential uh, value. And so uh, it's likely to have a sizable impact. Uh, we stopped short of uh, trying to predict what it means for the average uh, homeowner because really by virtue of that revaluation process, there'll be all sorts of changes in individual values. And so uh, we think it's kind of disingenuous to try to project that at this point. But do keep in mind, uh, you know, if, if we trend in the way that I expect we will and end where we, where we want to or close to it, uh, there should be a, a notable uh, decrease in overall tax rate. Again, how that affects individual homeowners will depend on what happens in their value. Uh, but it's worth just, just mentioning in passing here. 
In terms of budget documents and kind of more to the process issue, uh, you know, we've worked very hard over the last several years to modify our budget process, our, our product. Uh, last year, I think our budget book was over 400 pages, and some of the feedback we received that it's just daunting, it's just too much. And so I will give credit to Larissa Crockett, assistant town manager, who really spent a lot of time um, getting feedback from the community, understanding what parts of it make sense to you and what are uh, you know, not all that helpful. Uh, this book this year is about half the size. It's just over 200 pages. <laughs> I don't think we've suffered on quality or even quantity. We've really focused on what we've heard as, as uh, being important. Uh, so I'm very thankful for her effort and uh, anxious to get further feedback because we really view this as a work in progress. Uh, this is your budget. We want you to understand it. We want you to be able to give us feedback about it. And uh, if we're not communicating in such a way that uh, makes sense to you, we certainly need to hear that. What you see up here on the screen is actually a screenshot of our budget portal. It's set up differently this year. Uh, we are, will actually deliver the budget in three different ways. Uh, it's all based on the same information. Uh, the full budget, if you will, uh, is the full 206 pages. It's everything uh, that the Council and the Board of Education have. Uh, there's something called medium, uh, budget medium. Uh, that should take about an hour for someone to look through. So it's, again, the same content, but we've called out uh, a number of the background pieces. And then there's a light version, maybe 20 minutes, so we can take a quick read. So it's really designed for the uh, appetite and the aptitude of the reader. Uh, choose the version that you, you want. Maybe you start with the light and you move progressively up through if that's your fancy. But we're re really trying to serve this information up for anyone who's interested at whatever level or depth they want to go. Uh, we will, of course, have copies of the full budget available at the library and the clerk's office, and the full budget is available online as well. Lastly, we've made arrangements with Staples this year for copying. Um, that's been an issue in the past. If we follow our normal process, it was a couple hundred dollars, I think, to purchase a budget, which seems ridiculous. So it's far more affordable. Uh, as we speak, uh, Staples has the PDF of our budget. You report there, and you can get it much more affordably. I can't tell you what the actual cost is, but I think uh, comparatively we'd be very pleased. So the next part is really turning this budget over to the council and the school board. Tomorrow night, as I said, we will have um, the first reading with the schools, but we also want all of you to stay engaged, and there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Of course, the budget portal, as um, town manager um, just explained. We also ha will have the neighborhood outreach meetings, which I'll share um, those dates in just a moment. And, you know, of course, get the vote out. Like, get your friends to come out and vote. We want everyone in town to weigh in on this budget when the school um, budget validation vote takes place in June on June 11th. So for those neighborhood budget outreach meetings, there um, are five scheduled this year. We did five last year as well. We scheduled four initially, then added one. And this year, um, a little twist, you'll have two counselors and two school board members at each of the meetings. So really there to answer any questions that you have, but also get your input. Because remember, first reading is the start of the conversation. Um, we really will be making adjustments along the way based on what we're hearing from the community and based on some of those items that are in motion. And so I won't read the dates to you there, um, but we hope that you can try to come to at least one. I would encourage you to come to more than one if it's possible in your schedule because each conversation really takes a new shape depending on who from the community attends. Um, and they really are engaging and the time goes by quite quickly. So I'll just wrap it up. Uh, the last piece on process is really the adoption process. The council has a, a very prescribed process to do so. I think wisely last year, Councillor Foley was the one who advocated uh, really separating the presentation uh, with the first reading. And so in fact, uh, next Wednesday will be the first reading of, of the budget. Um, before then, of course, uh, the school board, I think just happened to it. You did more than edit. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can speak through this. So, <laughs> yes. so tomorrow, Thursday the 4th, uh, the school board will conduct its first review of the budget. That will be followed by the town council on Wednesday, April 10th. That will conduct the, the first reading of the budget. There's a public hearing scheduled for May 1. 
then there's a joint workshop between the full town council and the Board of Education on May 8th. Uh, second reading is scheduled for May 15th. And then second reading for school board is May 16th. And all of that uh, culminates on the validation vote, which is scheduled for June 11th. The polls open up at 7 a.m. Polls open at 7 a.m., close <coughs> at 8, 8 p.m.? Yes. Uh, and that will be at the high school. All of the meetings I mentioned will be held in these chambers. So that? The schedule that was on the slide is on the back of the one chamber, except if you could remember tomorrow, Thursday, was the board. Okay. Thank you. 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 My apologies. So that's our quick overview. Uh, we appreciate your attention this evening and look forward to a long, not long, but robust. Uh, discussion over the next several weeks. Uh, so you're right. But the process, of, we're on our way. So uh, in six weeks or so, we'll be through it. Mm -hmm. Does any questions? <clears throat> no, just wonder if any, if any counselors had any questions or comments before we close out this, this conversation. Mm -hmm. Looking like everybody's, okay. I w well, I yeah. Council full. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I will say thank you for accommodating my request from last year. I do like having a little bit more time before the first read to be able to kind of dive in um, and responding to, you know, their community in terms of the light, medium, and robust. I think it gives people a lot of different options. We do hope people will be um, engaged and asking good questions. Uh, and thank you for your work. I know this is not the fun part of your job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, moving on to it on the agenda, the, the next item on the agem agenda is order number 19021. Uh, Public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Cheryl and Justin Ryan, DBA, the Dairy Corner, located at 612 U.S. Route 1. And Cody, would you like to This is, a, as it indicates, a new request for food handlers. It's a new owner. Um, they are, um, all the application is on file in the office, and everything is order in order, and they have um, complied with the zoning office, and I recommend approval. Recommend approval. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion, comment? Council Mayland. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to mention I'm, uh, I'm shocked, but I'm, I'm, I hope I'm, I'm happy for Robert Preventer and her family for selling. They've been a staple of our community for many, many years at the Dairy Corner and welcome the new owner. Um, I hope they're happy in retirement. It's a great place. Any other comments? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Um, the next item on the agenda is order number 19022. It's a public hearing and action on a request for food handlers and a liquor license from Peak Hospitality, Inc., DBA Pine Point Grill, located at 240 Pine Point Road. This again is a new owner. Um, application is on file and it's uh, all in compliance. They are, uh, have met with zoning and planning department and um, they're in compliance there as well. We would recommend approval. Thank you. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion? It's a public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, I apologize. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I apologize. Any, any, would anybody like to come to the podium and comment? <laughs> Seeing none. Um, back to all those in favor. That's unanimous. Um, order 19023, public hearing and action on the request for the Board of Education to place on the June 11th, 2019 special municipal election ballot a referendum language to create the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. Ballot question is as follows. Do you favor the formation of a regional service center pursuant to an interlocal agreement for the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center as approved by the governing bodies of the parties there too, and the commissioner of the Department of Education. And I think this was just reference, but um, Julie, do you want to give us any more? Or do you think you've kind of? There's actually um, an amendment to that. It should say. I have it. Oh, you have it? I okay, will good. amend it. 
Oh, it should say, okay. Yeah, I will when it comes. Okay. So again, just as much as we can all collectively rally the community around this, there is a Q&A document that's been created that runs through some of the common questions, but call me anytime. Um, I'm happy to sit down and you know have a coffee and talk about it if there's questions, but it really is a win-win opportunity for our community. Thank you. Any questions for Julie? Just a comment. I'd like to thank the Board of Ed for a very good Q&A accompanying that. So thank you. Answers lots of questions. Thanks. Anybody like to make any public comment on this issue? Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Well, there's an amendment. amendment. I have an amendment. Oh, go on. Okay. Uh, I move to amend, uh, move approval to amend main motion of order number 19023 to read as follows. Do you favor a plan for Scarborough School Department to join the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center through an interlocal agreement that will allow the school department to receive additional revenue through the state funding formula and to more efficiently procure goods and services? Take it. All those in favor of the motion? Just got any? The amendment. The amendment. The amendment. So we're back to the, the main motion. <coughs> any discussion of the uh, council poll? Um, I would just add that I, I really like the language change. I think that's going to help a lot with people understanding what, you know, I think part of what happened is it did get a little bit lost and people didn't really understand and the turmoil of everything else going on. It just kind of got put to the back wing, but I do hope f folks will get out and support this because it can only be a good thing for us. Any additional comments or questions, discussions? All those in favor of approving as amended? Unanimous. Thank you. Old business is order number 19014, second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 304, Town of Scarborough Purchasing Policy. I know this has been in front of us before. I don't mm -hmm. know, Jean Marie or Tom? I don't have any, yeah, I don't have anything to add to it. Did you <coughs> know so? Not particularly. This is, uh, as mentioned, it's gone through committee. It's really a modernization of, uh, of a policy. I, I would note that our town auditors indicated that uh, it was time we look at it. and. I think it's good that they did, and uh, the recommendations uh, that have come forward to the committee, I think, uh, make sense, and we'd certainly recommend you, you consider them. Anybody wishing to comment on this? Seeing on motion, motion to approve. So move. Second. Any discussion, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, order 19024, <coughs> first reading, and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance, Section 1, Contract Zoning. Jay Chase is here. The yeah. Sure. Would sure. you <laughs> best for him to introduce? the two processes 
to, uh, again, sort of bring the public uh, and direct the butters into the fold maybe a bit earlier in the process. So with that, <coughs> the language you have before you really uh, seeks to do that. It, it eliminates the current language that speaks about mo uh, modifications and amendments um, that sort of spells out a separate process um, and really brings both new contract zones and amendment and amended amendments to existing contract zones to the same process right at the outset. And that is, again, sort of that joint hearing of the planning board and council <coughs> with the public notice uh, and, direct, and mailings uh, to direct the butters. Um, so that's really the extent of the language that's before you. And of course, I'm um, happy to answer any questions or uh, ordinance committee members may push their way in or not. So. Does anybody have any questions? No. Okay. No. Any any comments from the public? Seeing none. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Um, is there any discussion? Uh, as uh, Mr. Chase mentioned, we did uh, discuss this uh, in ordinance. Came out of ordinance unanimously. Um, and just so the public will know, the next step this is to send it to um, planning board um, for their further sure it meets their needs. So I think we're making a good move here. Council Donner? I think this is a very good process improvement uh, to uh, make it very clear to the public that those people who are directly affected uh, receive notification right off the bat. So I'm in favor of this. Councilor Hayden, did I see you? Uh, the only thing I'd say is uh, uh, thank you for the comments uh, from my fellow counselors and Jay for teeing it up. Uh, I felt very good about uh, how this made its way through the through the committees. We had uh, a good discussion at the Long Range Planning Committee and and also uh, good indications from the Planning Board not to uh, you know uh, preempt their you know their review of this. But good full discussion. Some additional questions that were raised and I think uh, addressed. Uh, satisfactorily so uh, thanks everybody for your support and um, it was a good learning experience for me thanks anyone else no with that all those, all those in favor Thank you. Um, the next order is not order number 19025 an act on request to amend chapter 302a the town committee board's manual relating to the to the charge for the energy committee Yes, I know Rick Miking is the chairman of the engine committees here and would like to address uh, the council regarding this matter. Thank you. Chairman Hayes and members of the Scarborough Town Council, good evening. My name is Rick Miking and I reside at 23 Her Road. I'm here tonight representing the Energy Committee to provide some information and context to this agenda item. But to do that, we have to go back to 2009, <coughs> when the Town Council passed Resolution Number 09-06, approving the formation of an ad hoc energy committee. This committee was charged with advising the Town Manager, the Council on Energy Programs, Projects and Policies, through conservation and alternative energy use, all working in conjunction to reduce town energy costs. In January 2010, the Ad Hoc Energy Committee reported their progress to the Town Council during their workshop. The Energy Committee made these following recommendations. Develop a comprehensive energy plan. Request that the Council review and revamp guidelines for purchasing policies to incorporate a 10 to 15 year payback. Develop guidelines and energy industry standards for new construction or major renovations on municipal properties and incentive plans for the private sector. Fourth, we were to assure the existing renewal and new contracts include energy efficiency as a priority. Identify where the town expends the greatest amount of energy and work toward reducing when feasible. And finally, the ad hoc committee recommended that the committee become a standing committee within the town structure. On April 7, 2010, the Town Council unanimously approved the last item I mentioned, the creation of the Energy Committee, with the charge you have before you tonight, excluding the red lines. <laughs> the 
The Energy Committee was back in front of Town Council in May of 2011, seeking approval of Scarborough's <coughs> first comprehensive energy plan. This now approved plan had a five-prong approach to energy management for Scarborough. First, establish an energy office. Second, implement conservation measures. Third, continue and improve benchmarking. Fourth, implement the integrated energy model, which is commonly referred to as our tri-generation plan. It's right outside. And finally, expand and continue the education and outreach. Between 2011 and 2016, the Energy Committee went to work and accomplished benchmarking on the municipal buildings. We obtained aero grants with the stimulus funds for infrared heating and boiler upgrades in several fire stations. We completed three solar projects that included the Beach House, the Community Service Maintenance Building, and North Scarborough's Fire Station. We studied methods in reducing municipal solid waste with public e education, such as the stickers you find on the waste and recycle carts. We planned and supported the, the Town Hall's TriGen project, funded in part through a competitive efficiency main incentive uh, grant. Incidentally, this system is now being integrated with the new public safety building, supplementing the electrical and thermal loads. And finally, we have a sustainability coordinator on staff. With those accomplishments, the committee went back to the 2011 energy plan, updated and revised it, and again came before the council in early 2018, seeking approval of what is now called Scarborough's Comprehensive Energy and Sustainability Plan. This new plan has four major pillars. Scarborough sustainability, sustainable, sustainable infrastructure, transportation, and benchmarking. In addition, this new energy and sustainability plan is now a cornerstone in the forthcoming update to the Scarborough Comprehensive Town Plan. We come before you tonight seeking approval to the revised committee charge and a notable committee name change, Scarborough Sustainability Committee. We come before you not only because we have accomplished many of the items in our original charge, but we feel there's more to do and we have to expand our focus beyond just energy issues. You have before you a revised committee charge and on behalf of the entire committee, we ask you to support this revised charge. I'm happy to try and hmm. answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your time and your support. Does anybody have any questions this evening? Looking around, no? Um, thank you. Are there any comments from the public? Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion, comments? Oh, that's for voice, sorry. I, I would just want to say I would applaud the committee because I, so many times, you know, committees just get stuck in what they're working on um, and they don't necessarily cross the things off the list that they went set out to do initially and then evolve. And it feels very much like that's what this committee is doing. Um, and uh, I think that's tremendous and I think a lot of committees could benefit from seeing that. It feels good when you get things off the to-do list and to, to move <coughs> forward. So very nice, well done. Anyone else? Council Dono? I've been the liaison of, uh, to the committee for several years and the committee operates at a very high level. It has a number of uh, people uh, like Rick Meinking, uh, who are in the business of, of sustainability issues and energy conservation issues. Uh, it was very encouraging to see them uh, kind of move towards the whole issue of sustainability because their involvement in projects like uh, uh, waste management uh, uh, are, are part of what we want to have a committee looking at. And this uh, uh, Energy Committee has taken up that charge time and time again. So I support this change. Anyone else? All those in favor? Yes. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Um, order number 19026, after the request to set the date, time, and location of the school budget validation referendum election for Tuesday, June 11th, 2019 at 7 a.m. at the Scarborough High School and Alumni Gym located <coughs> on 11 Municipal Drive. Tony, you want to 
Mr. Mr. Standard, Mr. Pro <laughs> standard procedure for um, the warrant to be signed so we can um, notify the voters, the residents of Scarborough that there's going to be an election. And it also sets the wording for the ballot on there as well, which there will be two. Uh, the school budget, do you favor approving the Scarborough school budget for the upcoming school year? And the other one is uh, the validation question, too, is do you wish to continue the budget validation referendum process in the Scarborough School Administrative <coughs> Unit for the next three years? So. Does anybody have any questions for Toby? Mm -hmm. Anybody from wants to make a public comment? Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion, comment? All those in favor? Unanimous. Um, the last item on the agenda is order 19027, action on the request to set the date for nomination papers to be available to fill a vacancy on the town council created by the resignation of Sean Baybine with a term to expire 2020 from Tuesday, April 4, 2019, proposed a business on, on Tuesday, April 16, 2009. That doesn't make sense, does it? Mm. Oh, it was from April 4, 2000, the close of business on April 16, 2000, to set the special initial election date for Thursday, June 11th, to coincide with the school budget validation referendum election. Um, this, is, again, is brought forward due to the resignation of Councillor Baybine. Um, the time frame that's being recommended was to um, have an electronic ballot. That's why the time frame was so, um, it's 12 days. We would have to get our proofs to the um, printer by the 17th of April in order to get them here by May 10th in order to start processing absentees. Council Donovan. Mr. Chair, after public comment, I'll be ready to make a motion to amend. Thank you. Anybody from the public would like to comment on this item? Seeing none, Council Donovan. The amendment I would like to make is to extend the period. Oh, no. uh, so moved. Motion. So moved. Second. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, move to amend uh, 19027 uh, uh, to extend the period of time for returning uh, uh, papers uh, for candidacies. Uh, the uh, Order recites that that deadline is presently Tuesday, April 16, 2019, and I would like to uh, uh, move to amend it to state <coughs> April 30, 2019. Second. Okay. Uh, I think several of us thought this was. Uh, too short a period of time, from the 4th to the 16th. I conferred with the town manager and uh, the town clerk uh, today to get a better understanding of what would be an optimal schedule. And I think both of them would be probably be in a best position to uh, explain to the audience what, uh, what was involved in selecting April 30th. Yeah, I can start. The, the normal uh, period of time for circulation of nomination papers is 30 days, and so this nearly replicates that. The reason that we suggest April 30th be the date, that will enable uh, the, this council to actually approve the warrant at your meeting May 1, and that will really put us on schedule. So they, I think this does the best it possibly can to extend all the proper prescribed time frames and allow for a full um, uh, over 30 days of absentee balloting as well. So um, it's, it's about as good as we can get, I think, given mm -hmm. the circumstances. Any other comments? Or... Councilor Kettering? Yeah. Um, uh, when I originally looked at the dates, I thought, oh, that's pretty short. And then having worked in elections, I know that hand counting is can be fraught with error or whatever, not necessarily. We do, I think we do a great job in Scarborough, but um, having given it uh, a great amount of thought and discussion with fellow, you know, some of my fellow counselors, I, I absolutely believe that I'd rather have it more wide open period to have as many people who are interested as possible um, able to take uh, papers uh, and get their names um, on the ballot and I encourage anybody with any interest, you know, to talk to any of us on the council. We'd love to see you 
run. And just a reminder that the seat is only for the remainder of Mr. Vabine's term, which means it's only until 2020. So good way to try it out and see if you like it. Okay. be that long. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Councilor Johnson? Yeah, I would just like to, uh, first of all, thank Councillor Donovan for bringing the amendment forward. I really think the town's getting it right in this case. Uh, I did earlier today go in and personally apologize to Todi for, <laughs> for creating more work or supporting an effort to create more work for her. Um, but I think with the timing of April vacation, which half of this town probably leaves for the South, and what we're looking at for press releases uh, to inform the public, I think it's the right move uh, for the town and for the people that might be considering running. So I, I'll support this. Yes. All those in favor? As a minute. Returning to the main motion, um, request to motion, a, a vote to approve it as amended going forward. Is there a motion? So moved. Yeah. 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 Any vote. comment? Councilor Bela? Thank you. Um, just a couple of clarifying uh, kind of comments that because that, um, I can't remember the term that was, you know, sometimes. Uh, uh, comments that are made become the narrative um, and so I just want to make sure there's proper perspective that the resignation does not take effect until June 10th so that people need to understand is that I, I do plan on fulfilling my obligation or commitment through the budget process um, and working with everyone and um, the other piece was I, I really while this might change the electronic process I did want to mention that last year we had an ad hoc committee that reviewed um, our electoral process because of a couple of uh, um, unique experiences and um, the recommendation was that we try to have the electronic ballot as as much as possible so I, I appreciate the town clerk and the manager looking at that short you know kind of time frame and I, I've got to give a shout out to former counselor um, Timmy Downs uh, mm -hmm. Timmy Downs was able to take out papers and return them within less than an hour with <laughs> and it's a very easy process it's 25 signatures and he did it at like 52 minutes. So it is possible <laughs> at the very last minute. And in fact, I think he even filed it on the very, took it out on the very yeah, last day mm -hmm. and filed it within the very last hour. Did. So it is possible. Um, but that's a unique part of Scarborough history. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? All those in favor. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, item nine on the agenda is standing and special committee reports. I'll start with Councilor Hamill. Like yeah, I, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Hayes. Uh, I did want to, uh, I just had one update, and that was uh, uh, really to remind everybody that uh, there were awards uh, uh, handed out by Echo Maine uh, last week, and I'm pleased to report there were uh, three, three, three categories, business award winners. Uh, uh, there were also... Um, um, individual award or nonprofit award winners and individual awards. So we had uh, Meredith Banker uh, from Scarborough who received one. Um, we had the Friends of the Scarborough Marsh who received the recognition. Uh, and then finally, we uh, had uh, there were 16 individuals who, you know, who were awarded. And then there was finally. Um, uh, and the business award, Chase Street Soap Company from Scarborough. So, and we're pleased that we had uh, such good representation across those categories. So, geez, please join me in extending congratulations to those individual winners. The uh, Energy Committee met uh, last week. A couple of things of note that are of kind of interesting. Uh, the committee has been. Uh, discussing with Scarborough Downs uh, the idea of uh, a, a microgrid system uh, yeah. at Scarborough Downs. Uh, nothing has been formalized, but that would be in the form of a utility uh, and, and serve that. The uh, means of power, source of power, would be uh, in all likelihood solar uh, <coughs> or and or an anaerobic digester, mm -hmm. which we've talked about before, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, is uh, something that Exeter Agri Energy uh, has used very successfully in Exeter, Maine. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's, was on there. We just approved the charge change uh, that was discussed. They're also talking about a sustainability fund, uh, uh, proposing something that would 
<clears throat> be a, a, a charge upon a developer of individual units if they did not adopt certain uh, efficiencies in the construction of the building. So that may be coming to us in the, in the future. And there is uh, a work going forward on a recycling program, as I think you're aware from town manager's report. We are incurring costs now uh, for materials that are contaminated in, in the recycling uh, uh, pickup. Uh, uh, this is, I think, budgeted as a $90,000 cost. So this is a serious issue. Uh, and they're developing a program <clears throat> that would uh, attempt to begin to better educate people on uh, uh, how to uh, make determinations on recycling. Uh, and uh, a small field uh, effort that would involve actually grading people on the, uh, how, how they're doing. So more on, more on that uh, as it advances. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, there was also uh, uh, the bag ban uh, that had been uh, advanced by the Conservation Commission was also discussed. I think it was said that SEDCO members uh, had also reviewed it and were very supportive. Thank you. Councilor Kennedy? Speaking of the bag ban, <laughs> Peter Slavinsky of the uh, Conservation Commission did reach out to me as chair of ordinance, so I'll be talking to him on Friday, so more on that. Um, the only one I have is historic preservation. We met last night and just talked about ongoing efforts to inform people that they may be living in houses that they may wish to have uh, placed, uh, you know, under our preservation designation, I guess. Uh, just. And we did have a person show up last night who was very excited about it and asked mm -hmm. questions and whatnot. Um, I'm also pleased um, that we're moving forward um, with talking to the historic pres uh, Historical Society, I get my history straight here, uh, regarding their fundraising for the school, Beach Ridge School. Uh, Mr. Hall has placed something into the budget, $44,000, um, to help out, to get them going to at least try to stabilize the building. Um, and I happen to have a brand new client who happens to be a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to connect the uh, groups just to talk and see what could be done. So that's going on there. Uh, last week also was Maine Municipal's Legislative Policy Committee meeting. Uh, I went up, it's a day long meeting on reviewing all the bills that the guy at the end of the table and his buddies mm -hmm. are trying to bring, bring forward to us. Um, and um, again, the, the major thrust of Maine Municipal this year is the restoration of the uh, municipal revenue sharing program. So there, there were some other things in there too, but that's going to be our major thrust. So that's it. Thank you. Councilor Paul. Yeah, so most of my committees are meeting in the next seven to ten days. I won't steal Councilor Johnson's thunder with uh, the round table that we had last week. Um, but I will put a plug in for Saturday night. You have no plans. Taste of the town uh, gala at being held at Camp Ketcha. Uh, time pilots are playing. We've got some really great auction items, including a week long stay at Higgins Beach. Um, there's some other getaways. There's axes and jelly and all kinds of great things. So, you know, come. You have to. You have to see it to believe it. Um, so there are, I think, only 20 tickets left. So it, we do expect the event will sell out, and all the proceeds do go, in fact, to support the Eastern Trail Alliance. Um, so come on out, have some great food, good times. See you there. Council of Hamill and I, are we still dating on, are we going to that? Yeah. Uh, I can't You're remember. the third wheel now, I'm afraid. I'm like my wife into joining us, so. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> we discussed it. Uh, Communication committee, uh, we had our first community roundtable, uh, quarterly roundtable. Still don't quite know what the name of it is, but we meet every quarter around a table. Um, the five biggest topics we talked about were the new portable classrooms being purchased from Acorners, uh, for Acorners, I should say. Uh, some very general budget concerns, 
We also had a gentleman join us from uh, Scarborough Youth Football, uh, just wondering how he could, and other non-profits, non-prof- uh, <coughs> utilize town, uh, school organizations to get the word out about many uh, non-profit entities in the community. Uh, we were asked as newly elected officials if our perspective of local government changed now that we're on the other side of the table. <laughs> and the answer is no, I still hate it. Um, I'm kidding, completely kidding. Uh, and we, this was act- the most informative for me was we had a nice long discussion to count uh, recycling do's and don'ts and the challenges that come with educating the public. And uh, great credit is due to whoever was running the town Facebook page the next morning because they took a, a um, suggestion directly from Paula O'Brien, who is a resident of Scarborough, and they implemented, implemented it literally within 12 hours. Uh, so there was some, it was nice to see something uh, come to fruition that was a direct result of this meeting. Uh, as far as the Board of Education is concerned, they've had enough air time today, so I'll skip them. Uh, the... <laughs> The uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce has uh, published a, they unanimously voted uh, to support the Piper Shores uh, contract zone mm-hmm. amendment. Uh, they have also having a uh, career expo that is in South Portland. Uh, it's in South Portland, yeah, it's on May 1st. And uh, this is a career expo where many kids from different high schools can come by and it's a career fair of sorts. Uh, and the, Chamber of Commerce have been doing this for a ton of years. Mm-hmm. It was at Scarborough, now it's at SOPO. Um, but anyways, that's on May 1st. And I don't know if, do any of our, our students attend that, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. And actually, the Career Pathways Commission that's in the budget for SOPO, right. the communicator making that happen yep. for the chamber. Yep, totally. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Uh, and with that, that is it. Thank you, Councilor Bevan. Thank you for finance. <clears throat> <coughs> um, want to uh, mention the schedule that's upcoming starting on uh, Monday, April 8th from 2 to 3 p.m. Approximately, uh, we'll have a um, contingency from the Town Council and School Board at the Public Library to present the budget and to take uh, public comment. I need to apologize to uh, Mr. Hamill. I actually will not be able to attend, so I, I do apologize. I need to be in Augusta for the, the one <laughs> bill that I am the author of. Um, I'm, I'm fighting to keep it alive and have to have a uh, stakeholder meeting with um, Representative Chiazzo and others. So, um, but I will be here for the 5.30 Town Council Finance meeting um, in which we will um, uh, solely go over the school's budget presentation um, on a more um, granular basis, uh, not too granular and in the weeds, but at least to some extent. On um, April 24th is the second meeting of the Scarborough, uh, the Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. Um, Tom, get me, uh, if I get this right, it's gonna be fire, EMS, and public works. Was there somebody else's technology? Oh, I, I beg your pardon, I, I don't have that. It's a little far out, but April 24th is the second one, and then the third one uh, for departmental budgets is um, scheduled, tentatively scheduled for May 6th, and that's for any remaining budget, uh, remaining departments that we find uh, that, um, that aren't specific, but if we do decide that we want a, small, you know, a department that's a little smaller, we can have it on that date. Correct. I think the opinion of the finance members is once you see the budget, you'll have a better sense of which ones you want to invite in. So to the extent that starts to emerge, we'd love to get those scheduled. So please be mindful of that. Thank and, you. and I will mention that, um, although I don't, I want to say May 13th, um, <coughs> there will be a joint uh, town council and school board finance committee meeting. I believe it's the 13th. I can't remember the exact date, but um, we'll have that at a later meeting. That's Thank it. You. Yes, very quickly. Uh, As was mentioned, I I did include my uh, funding for, uh, proposed funding, I should say, for the Beach Ridge Schoolhouse renovation. This is the so-called phase one that was presented to you at your last meeting. Uh, I've included $44,000, which was the actual cost from uh, proposals. Uh, I appreciate that they asked for a a larger amount, and perhaps that's a point of discussion with the Finance Committee. Um, I am proposing that we use land bond funds. We just have a few, few of those funds left. One of the authorized um, purposes from the voters when they approved that bond was restoration of historic sites, which uh, this seems to fit very nicely in that. Mm-hmm. Um, Councilor Foley mentioned the uh, Eastern Trail Gala. I will be in attendance that evening myself. I've been asked to provide an update on the Close the Gap portion. Uh, they're really looking at, uh, actually, I think they're focusing on some southern challenges uh, on the route. Uh, but the close the gap piece is uh, lurching forward toward uh, construction. We're still in the right of way phase, and I'll uh, I'll provide an update to the uh, crowd that's gathered that night 
uh, that I'm sure is interested to hear where we stand. I'm very pleased to announce that uh, the police department was successful in obtaining a grant through uh, an organization called Police Assisted Addis Addiction and Recovery Initiative, PARI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this grant will help uh, our Operation Hope program. <coughs> we'll have the services of a VISTA volunteer uh, for a full year. Uh, we're one of 13 communities uh, across the country, so it's, it's a, a tremendous honor for us to get this. I know Chief uh, Moulton is excited. He's really anxious to find a way to not pass this off to someone else, but to really find a, a longer term, more sustainable um, uh, approach. Uh, it does look as though the Mills administration is taking a, a kind of a state view, mm -hmm. which I think will be helpful in finding some of those solutions. But this will provide us uh, staff support to really manage that transition. So we're, we're very excited and I'm very proud of him and his leadership on that program. Uh, lastly, just I, I say this uh, really for my own benefit, but I suspect yours as well, just housekeeping. We've got a lot of things going over the next four to five to six weeks. So uh, between budget review for those of you on finance, uh, neighborhood budget outreach, which all of you have one or more commitments at, uh, and then the normal routine of the council, we do have a number of workshops uh, in the queue. Uh, next Wednesday, April 10th, we have the Library Trustees we're meeting with. They were gracious enough to get bumped from tonight. Um, I think it may be fortuitous in that next week is Library Week, so yeah. they, they feel good about being here um, to honor that as well. Following that, I've asked Council Chair Hayes to uh, allow a workshop on May 1 on recycling. You've heard that mentioned a couple of times. Uh, <coughs> Not so much about the financial uh, uh, consequences, though that's an important part. We are going to be doing some field work and uh, want to make sure that we get the word out, we message that properly, and I think it's important for the council to be fully aware of uh, what that program is and, and uh, the details. For the future, the other ones that have been talked about and not yet scheduled are uh, a discussion around growth and growth management. Um, we do have to do the annual elected officials training for stormwater MS4 permit. Mm -hmm. Really exciting stuff. <laughs> <It's> after, <laughs> I just that's after eyes. June, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's by the end of June. So uh, I think I'll schedule the first meeting schedule in June. Schedule it for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the final one is uh, I'd love to be delivering a purchase and sale agreement with the public safety building mm -hmm. that has not yet uh, come forward. Um, I keep hearing that there's something in the wings, but uh, either way, I really want to update the council on the territory we've covered over the last year, and more importantly about how we're going to uh, make this deal happen. I'm getting anxious by the day as I see this building take shape, and knowing that I have proceeds of that building sale that we're counting on to pay those bills. So um, I'll be working with Council uh, Chair Hayes about scheduling that uh, in the upcoming months as well. Thank you. Uh, and uh, pest management uh, has done a report uh, uh, that covers their whole history. Oh, great. Uh, and, and they would like uh, some of our time and get into that queue. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So with that, the, the last item on the agenda is Councillor member comments, and I'll start at <laughs> Councillor Bay Great. Right. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I want to recognize and ask, you know, in your own time, um, if we could, uh, if you can find the time to give um, um, some pause and blessings to you as the state trooper that passed away, mm -hmm. uh, Detective Ben Campbell, out on the uh, turnpike today. Mm -hmm. um, he was hit by a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And these uh, men and women that serve, whether it's locally or at the state or the sheriff's departments or as constables, do an incredible job. And he was a young man. So um, if we can, um, if you can do that on your own time, but uh, everyone needs a prayer once in a while. Um, I did want to mention, got to, I, I forgot all about the referendum this year, that this is the year in which, uh, by the way, I believe it's every three years yeah. that the communities are required to um, vote on whether to continue voting on a school budget. And I unabashedly, or on a, um, with no embarrassment, I hope that people vote no, that we discontinue um, having a school budget referent, uh, validation process. The reason is if you go back and do the research, that process was established as a result of Governor Baldacci's effort to consolidate school districts and RSUs and the purpose of that was to make sure that communities who participated in that had an equal say or had a weighted say in the decisions regarding particularly around budgets. So while we decided to go in a different path and, and keep our individual school district 
Um, this was not what was originally intended, and I think that it needs to go away um, so that um, there can be more harmony in communities and hold us accountable as elected officials for the decisions that we make. Um, I did want to mention um, also that we had a workshop before the meeting. If people didn't ch uh, tune in in time, it was, a apps, I think, one of the best and interactive and engaging uh, presentations by the school board that I've seen over many years. They've always been good. Um, it was um, extremely clear, very thoughtful, articulate, and supported. And I truly hope you know, one of the comments that I made at our finance committee meeting is that a year ago, just about, um, you know, we went through a process in which a lot of trust around our elected officials was called into question, and, and members um, of the school board um, were, were replaced by new members. And I think that, if anything, based on that presentation and the conversations that we need to start trusting and allowing them to do their job and not trying to second guess the decision and really focus in on what our responsibility is, and that is determine what is the proper financing solution um, for, their, uh, for their needs. Uh, because that is our decision in that it's not um, the other pieces that go along with that. So I do appreciate all of the community's comments, but I hope people understand that the reason why I don't respond to issues about redistricting and enrollment is not my purview. It's not that I don't care, but it's I rely on the expertise and, and the work of the school board and the, and the school officials to come up with those solutions. So I appreciate everything that you guys um, did and have done, and um, good luck. Um, you have my full support. And I'll end um, only uh, two positive notes. One is, you know, there's been a lot of conversation at the State House about the use of uh, Indians and Native American symbols and other pieces. And I just think about the fact that um, I am, uh, will be leaving the council pretty much on a 20th anniversary in some sense. And the very first thing I did, because it was a school board member at the time, I had to make the decision to support or not to support the changing of the Redskins name. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't even though... I felt at the time that um, we needed to go through a, a very lengthy process, which we did. In the end, it was a unanimous decision by the school board. And the fact is that 20 years later, hearing from the Penobscot Nation and Passamaquoddy and the other areas, you know, Scarborough is very much viewed in good light for having the foresight 20 years ago to make that decision. And I'm very proud um, that we did that. And we did it in a very thoughtful and respectful manner so that we also respected the, you know, the alumni and the traditions, but I hope people understand that uh, that movement or that issue is is not just about um, it's about supporting the children that are in our school systems today. We all have connectivity and connections with our you know the, our alma mater and the great stories, but it's about the schools that we need to give our kids, and it comes down to their mascots that they want. And so um, I think it's um, It's it's nice to watch Skowhegan. And actually, I did get um, actually quite a few school board members reached out and asked, you know, how did we do this? And, and um, so it was nice to see that they incorporated a lot of that. And good luck to, the, to that community. Last but not least, I've got to mention, today, um, the Baybine family made history in the state of Maine. And I'm just um, I'm higher than a kite about that. There are now two Baybines actually elected to the Maine State, uh, Maine state Legislature this 129th session. My cousin, um, by so... It's a very long and distant uh, relationship. Um, he's significantly Jesus. younger, but it's my grandfather's aunt, um, his great great grandson, um, is um, a, a cousin. All right, sure. And the Baybine family, we are all related, no matter how close that might be. So, uh, Representative Sean Paulus from Bath, my hometown, uh, which became the hometown of uh, um, William King, uh, was, was elected. And I actually forgot, I almost forgot that. I did want to mention, uh, so congratulations to him. The state is obviously much better today with two Baybines in the main house. <laughs> and I did want to mention um, to two young men in Scarborough um, who re recently received or will receive their Eagle Scout honors. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Volan um, um, is uh, receiving his, and then Colby Jackson uh, Paris, if I said that correctly. So congratulations to them as well. Uh, well deserved for what they've accomplished. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's not. No, it's great. Uh, I guess I'm going to take my comment uh, just for one, get on my soapbox a little bit with, uh, we have a, I beat this drum a little bit at rules and policy. We have a policy on the books that um, in our position we can't advocate for anything uh, of a political nature. So it struck me that tonight, for instance, I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily uh, speak well of the Spago Alliance vote. And I, because I believe if, I actually did so, that would be violating the policy. So I'm going to take this as a small moment to point that out about what I see as a
fatal flaw in our policy. All right, so yep. next in yep. line, and we're going to be discussing that at Rules of Policy <laughs> on Friday, yep. so the timing is fortuitous. Yep. Um, I don't have a lot, but there is something that uh, I have that's been kind of whittling in my head, and I'm going to build on uh, Councillor Babine's comments around uh, the workshop this evening. I thought it was really, really well done, really appreciated um, the, you know, communication and work of the school board to really thoughtfully share how they have explored what their options are and they and, and they really feel strongly this is their best uh, best option um, because I, I've been concerned uh, I remain concerned I should say I'm not this is not a new thing for me just like our enrollment climbing is not new and the need for uh, that's not new my concern is not new my concern is how we as a community choose to address these issues I've seen and heard some pieces on social media that well, this is we we are going to get we're getting portables because of the recall. The recall had nothing to do with portables. Okay, this has been something that's been coming for a while. Um, we're not set back a million years. Uh, it is time to put those things behind us and start to move forward. Um, you know, and, and I uh, I just I challenge all of us to think about that and consider that because we are heading into budget season and we know it's going to be contentious so when you're feeling like you're concerned about something pick up the phone and try to call that person directly to start with um, I think that's always that's my first try go to uh, action and behavior and I think if as a community if we all did more of that um, we would see far less of the other so uh, again I was really appreciative of that I, I am in full support of it as well um, and uh, that's all I have for tonight and Saturday night. See you there. Mm -hmm. Dancing shoes. <laughs> Councilor Kettering. Um, yeah, I'm just going to uh, speak also to the uh, to workshop. It was interesting. I had read a lot of the materials before as a teacher who taught from a cart for three years. I know that's no fun. Um, that being said, um, the reason I asked about the questions I asked was, I don't want to see us in portables in this school uh, department any longer than we have to be. Uh, I think it's outrageous that we've had them for as long as we have at the middle school, for whatever. Um, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can begin now uh, with the ed educating the community about why a centralized Primary school is probably the best way to go, um, but you know this is the the start of that. And as someone who sells houses to people with kids, yeah, they're coming to Scarborough, and and I think the numbers are going to go up uh, over time. Um, my other comment has to do with the first pass on the budget. I want people to remember that this is just the first pass. I know there's going to be some people, I'm sure, I can guarantee them, I get some emails <coughs> saying, oh my God, the 4.33 on the mill rate and blah, blah, blah. That's just the first pass. Um, I, I definitely am, you know, I know I've gone on record saying I don't want us to see a mill rate of more than 3%. And I, it's going to take some work on the part of the school department. Um, and not so much municipal, the municipal side, I think you've done well on, on bringing that in, uh, but I know the school has bigger issues that they are dealing with, and they got to come up with something to start. Um, but I do hope that we can. No, I, I don't hope. I know <laughs> that we will be able to uh, work on those numbers and bring it to a point where I think people should be satisfied. We're never going to make everybody happy, but um, we have to do the best we can. So. That's it for me. Thank you. That's I mean, I think it was pretty evident that there uh, is some real urgency to the uh, uh, issues that were presented by the school board to us tonight. And I would think that all of us would join together to offer them uh, mm -hmm. support in any way we can to advance that discussion and analysis. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I hope the school board reaches out to uh, get our support because I think we recognize just how urgent the problem is and how difficult it will be in coming to uh, a conclusion as to what direction to go. Uh, 
I thought the presentation tonight was terrific. Uh, I, I really want to applaud the town manager and the superintendent uh, on the budget books, smaller, more readable. I know Larissa Crockett had a great deal to do with that. That was great. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say I've been in and out of town hall all the time uh, for one thing or another. Uh, I get to see Colette Matheson, uh, and, and she worked <coughs> over, over the weekend mm -hmm. doggedly to get this work product out. Uh, and, and Kate Bolton and Ruth Porter, I've worked with them for years now, and they should be applauded for the professionalism and quality of the work that they do. So I just wanted to, to give them that. Uh, the, uh, t the residential reval that's going on, uh, my judgment is it's not going to really, it's going to lower the tax rate because we haven't done one in since 2006. <clears throat> so property values are going to be much higher. But the, the, the mill rate will correspondingly drop down. I don't think uh, that people who are concerned about what's this uh, reval going to do to them, the vast majority of people are going to fall right in the middle. And so their tax bills aren't going to be much different than the tax bills they got the year before, other than what we decide uh, uh, is an appropriate uh, increase, uh, if any. So uh, I just thought people should understand. The reval is really not, uh, that's not what's going to drive this discussion. It's going to be how do we meet our goal of 3% uh, as a limit on the tax impact that we ask the town to bear. Thank you. That's yeah, I'd uh, like to build on a couple of points that people made. Uh, I mean, f first and foremost, I think the uh, the Board of Ed did a great job uh, coming back from a very tough meeting last week, which was uh, in part due to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, we asked some very tough questions there, and I think that uh, that meeting got off to the, a bad start because of, uh, you know, uh, some issues with timing and us not, you know, having communicated as well as we could. but. Uh, you know, it's funny, was, and I, I took some time to call around to the folks that actually were in that meeting uh, with hat in hand, and uh, I want to thank the folks that I talked to about that in terms of the spirit that they took uh, in, in redirecting and refocusing on that. And I remember talking to one person saying, I, I read through the operating protocol that the board uses for their own interactions, and I, you know, I, I only read it halfway through because I was violating about half of the things as I read. So, but, I, but in doing that, I, I, I did, when I read the first round of the budget, uh, I, I, you know, had kind of my typical reaction, uh, you know, which was, oh, gee, we missed the target, and, you know, it's going to be a tough season. But then I was reminded that this is a, this is a process. We've got a lot of road ahead. And I think one thing that's different um, and that we've all worked on is that we've tried to take time to have a conversation and to really work through issues. I think we did that with the workshop tonight, and we were at a different place on this thing, uh, you know, and, and really well aligned. And I think that there were two or three other things that happened this past week, uh, including uh, the issue with the, uh, the timing for the petitions to be turned in. And a really good example of where we're, people were open-minded about trying to solve for the problem instead of just lining up according to you know, uh, past practices. So I, I wanted to thank my fellow counselors for that and the other folks that participated in it. And I think that if we can do that sort of thing as we continue through the budget process, we ought to have a better outcome and all feel better about it. So special thanks to Tom and his team uh, for how uh, they took our requests in stride on top of a very busy week. Uh, they've turned out some great documents that I think are a vast improvement in terms of content and how it's going to help the town understand uh, the issues and the process as well. So, I mean, really well done. And oh, by the way, Tom hit his target first time uh, here, you know, on the numbers. So that, you know, was not, not lost. So um, those are my comments. I'm really encouraged by this, and I hope that's a theme that we can set uh, as a leadership example for the rest of the process. Thank you. 
and I guess I'll kind of echo a little bit. I'll follow my sword too. I do apologize um, for that the rough finance committee meeting we talked about. Um, there's some learnings from that, and but I do appreciate everybody staying at the table, staying engaged. Um, it was a good process tonight, so thank you. Um, I look forward. I do compliment the budget process, the books, and the materials we get. Just get better and better each year. I'm really excited about having about half the volume to get through <laughs> as, as a prior year. Um, so with that, you know, I, 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 I kind of applaud Councillor Foley, too, saying, you know, we have some work to do as a community as we, as we talk about these issues in the budget and where we go and look forward to maybe a different way of having those conversations. And I'll, uh, again, I apologize for my part and try to create a, a way that we can have those conversations civilly and respectfully. And so thank you. And with that, I guess, movement to adjourn, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you, everybody. Toady wins. Oh, that's your second win.